Now, today, we are gonna see. What if Naruto was Full Metal Ninja, with unlimited harem? Please subscribe this channel, because definitely I will try my best to provide a valuable content for you all. Also check the description to support the original author for this beautiful creation. Ed dotted the last full stop with unneeded flourish. He held up the piece of paper and checked through the calculations. Done. He said triumphantly, pleased that all the hard work had finally paid off. Just to make sure, he murmured out loud what he and his brother, Al, had worked out together. 35 liters of water, 20 kilos of carbon, 4 liters of ammonia, and 1 and a half kilos of lime. Phosphorus, 800 grams. Salt, 250 grams. Sulfur, 100 grams. Magnesium, 80 grams. Manganese, one and a half grams. Iron, five grams. Silicone, three grams. The Elric brothers moved around their laboratory with practiced ease. It was filled with bubbling test tubes, beakers, and vials, among other things that they would use soon. The ceiling was masked by the smoke that was coming from their instruments. It was also a discolored yellow from it reacting to the chemicals within the smoke. Ah! Hot, hot! Al yelped as he held the boiling pan with a kitchen cloth, the heat still passing through it with little difficulty. Careful, Ed scolded him lightly. That's gonna be part of our mum. He himself was holding a tray with various cans and jars in it, each filled with something different. He he, Al giggled. What should we say to her first when we see her? He asked, turning to his brother. Ed grinned back at him. Isn't it obvious? Don't tell our master? Al laughed and Ed joined him, they two talked towards the very large tin basin in the center of the room, they emptied the contents of what they were holding into it, then they set straight back to work again, drawing the transmutation circle around it. As they finished and were putting the final touches to the transmutation circle, Ed muttered quietly, the alchemy circle, he took it out a pocket knife from his pocket and cut the tip of his left index finger. Ed watched as the blood welled from the cut and started to trail down his finger. He handed Al the knife as he watched the blood being on the verge of dripping off of the digit. And, at the same time, they held out their hands and let several drops fall onto the mass that would soon be their mother, for the soul. The two knelt down and placed their hands gently on the outer border, making sure that they didn't smudge the chalk, of course. They shuffled a bit for a minute to make sure that they were comfortable and to just triple check everything that they'd done again. They then looked at each other in anticipation. Here it goes, Al. Al nodded. Yup. They closed their eyes and concentrated. They felt the familiar tingle of alchemy running down their arms and onto the transmutation circle. They could still see the bright sparks of the reaction even through their closed eyelids. There was a much bigger and longer spark that didn't die as fast as the ones before. The two opened their eyes, wanting to see their mother appearing, knowing that this would be the moment that it would happen. Light crested along the lines that they had drawn as the mass in the basin rose up, starting from the center. A large alchemic reaction burst up from the mass and crashed into the ceiling. It left a burnt smell in its wake parts of paint and plaster raining down softly afterwards. They grinned, waiting. The lightning strikes grew in their ferocity, its reach getting closer and closer to the brothers with each strike. The rattling of the beakers and test tubes grew louder and some smashed for seemingly no apparent reason. Ed and Al felt the wind that was coming from the reaction grow stronger. A lot stronger from what they were used to feeling normally. Ed's smile faded. Sensing something was wrong, he looked around warily, his hair whipping around in the wind. Big brother, Al said, a tinge of fear in his voice, something is wrong, he screamed suddenly, the abrupt sound echoing around the room, louder than everything else. Al lifted up his left arm where his wrist was disappearing under the second part of transmutation, deconstruction. However, there was no blood. It was just breaking up and disappearing before their eyes. Ed yelled out his brother's name frantically. Al. He felt something at his leg, a weird sensation that he'd never felt before. Staring down at it, he saw that the same was happening to himself. It's a rebound, 
he realized in horror. Big brother. Ed heard his brother scream out again. His brotherly instincts overrode his other thoughts and feelings and he reached out, trying to grab Al's stretched out hand, both with tears in their eyes. Both of their arms shook from the exertion and fear. No, suddenly, he was in an empty white space. A large empty white space, he couldn't even see any walls anywhere near him. Looking up, he couldn't see anything apart from that same white but there was nothing there that suggested that it was physically there and not just a huge expanse. A dream? He wondered. He looked around, seeing a floating, slab that was decorated with a strange-looking tree behind him. Al. His voice echoed slightly in the area. What the, what was I doing? He asked out aloud. Hey. Ed froze. That wasn't his thoughts, it didn't sound like his. Inner voice. His head whirled around, searching for the source of the voice. Who is it? He demanded. Here here, was the playful reply. I'm right here in front of you. Where? Ed began to ask but trailed off. There was a humanoid figure sitting casually on the floor. It had a shadow underneath it but, there were no features. It was blank. No clothes, skin, or face. There was only an aura surrounding it so that Ed could tell it from the landscape. Who are you? Ed asked curiously. He had been doing something, but what? He knew that it was important but he couldn't remember for some reason. He had been reaching out for a reason. Ah, thanks for asking, it said cheerily, raising a hand. I'm what you humans refer to as the world. Also known as the universe, or God, or true knowledge, or all, or one. Ed started at the names. The entity continued before Ed completely registered the implications, and, it pointed a finger at Ed, I'm you. What? An ominous creak behind Ed. He felt the hairs on the back of his neck prickle at the sound and he didn't turn, knowing that it was the slab but not wanting to know how it was opening without hinges, and hanging in midair. Ed yelled out as black hands reached out, T too much, and grabbed at his shoulders and head. The arms wound completely around his torso and yanked him off of his feet. They were soon all over his body, making sure that he couldn't escape but he still struggled against them as hard as he could. Be quiet, the entity said scornfully, isn't this what you wanted? The arms pulled him towards the door further and finally, into it. Even as he resisted, the door began to close in front of him. Just before the door closed completely, Ed heard the voice again. I'll show you, true knowledge, what the hell is this? Images. So many images. Voices murmured and screamed at the same time, attached to the pictures as they flashed by. Stop. He pleaded to no one. My head's gonna explode. They wouldn't stop coming. If anything else, they came faster. He couldn't distinguish what the words were saying, nor what he was seeing. All he could do was watch as everything sped by his head feeling like it was going to be crushed as his senses were being overloaded. I'm gonna mutilate it, no, please stop. Just as he thought that, Ed saw a silhouette. A familiar one that he had longed to see once more. He tried to reach her, as did she. Suddenly Ed found himself sprawled out, supine, in a lush green forest. He gasped, noticing how he no longer could feel his left foot and the immense pain that he was feeling because of it. It wasn't just because of Hat, but because it felt like he had fallen from about six foot up straight onto his stomach. Thank you teacher for that lesson. So he had no air in his lungs to scream no matter how much he wanted to. In the back of his mind, he heard a muffled, boom. Slowly turning his head to look the other way, Ed was relieved to see that Al was beside him, unconscious. That was his last thought before the world around him whited out. And and. I used my new ultimate move, the Rasengan, and it was awesome, Naruto said excitedly, telling Uruka what had happened when he and Jiraiya had gone to get Tsunade. Uruka smiled gently at his former student's antics. The smile froze as he sensed something. It was just a flicker of chakra in the far distance before it was gone. Naruto peered up at him, noticing his teacher's sudden distraction. E.H. What's wrong? Frowning thoughtfully. Uruka fished into one of his pockets and paid for his and Naruto's bill. He thought he did anyway, 
If he gave too much, that would give Naruto some free ramen for a while and if he gave too little, Tuchi would tell him the next time he came around. I need to check on something, Uruka said quietly as he stood up, he didn't know why he was going to see the Hokage undoubtedly, she had already sensed what he had but it worried him. It wasn't a signature that he recognized but from that brief spark that he had felt, he knew that it wasn't human, and it was old, powerful. Analyzing further, he realized that he had felt something to it some twelve years before, but this was different. He was wasting too much time think it over, he berated himself when he tried to think why it was different. He needed to go now, he headed straight for the Hokage's office. Tsunade walked slowly to her office, what she had seen troubling her. That Lee boy giving her the most to think about, she stopped, a frown marring her youthful features. She looked over her shoulder. What, within seconds, she was surrounded by a number of Junin, Shunin and Anbu. They had sensed it too and went straight to her, awaiting her orders. Scanning around her, Tsunade picked out five Anbu and barked out their names. They stood up straighter, waiting for her command. Go to the site where the chakra flare was last felt. Report back what you find. She gazed at each one in turn. I don't have to tell you to be careful. The five nodded curtly. They then disappeared from view, only leaving a swirl of leaves in their wake. Hawk crouched on top of a branch, having traveled quickly from Konoha. The other four were similarly perched on branches nearby. They were nearly on the spot that the different chakra had been felt. They weren't able to pinpoint it exactly but they knew that it had originated from this area. He glanced to Ocelot, knowing that she was a Hyuga. There was no need for words, there never usually was. He sensed the activation of the Bayakugan and waited. Ocelot turned her head slightly and back again, that being her only movement. The leaves around them rustled from the breeze picking up. Other than that, there were few other noises around them, even from animals. Keeping an eye on Ocelot for her signal that she had found something, Hawk thought over the puzzling situation. They had sensed the strange chakra even if it was for under a second and knew that it would be trouble. The five Anbu had been there when the Kyubi had attacked twelve years ago not all of them as Anbu at the time but they had each lived through it and they knew how powerful its chakra had felt then. This chakra felt similar to the Kyubi's level of power. However, it was different because there had been no malevolence force to it, it wasn't benevolent either, on the other hand. Saying that, where was the vessel of all the chakra? The Kyubi. Itself stood over 100 meters tall, from paw to the tip of its ears, not accounting the nine tails, of course. Yet, there was no sign of destruction of any kind, though. It would have been impossible for something so immensely powerful to condense it down so that it couldn't be sensed and the size of it had to be similar of that to the Kyubis. From what they could see around them, the forest was exactly how it used to be not a twig out of shape. It was hiding, that much was certain, and if it was hiding, it was up to something. Ocelot hissed. She had found something. There are two children, civilian both no older than 9 or 10 southwest, 42 meters, she supplied quickly. They're both covered in the alien chakra but. It's not coming from them. They're not illusions and they're human. She paused very briefly. Hawk knew that there was something else something else that was out of the ordinary. There had to have been if she was talking about them. She had hissed for a reason. One is missing his left leg from the knee down, the other, from below his left elbow, she continued. The limbs aren't in the vicinity, she added. So they're not conscious then, Hawk thought dryly. They had been ordered to report back whatever they found but all five knew that the children wouldn't be able to survive that long. Again, he thanked whoever was watching over them, if such a being actually existed, that Tsunade was their Hokage now. She would easily be able to help them. But first, they would have to stem the bleeding before the children bled out and the Anbu transported them to the hospital. Squirrel knew a fire jutsu. As one, they headed towards the children. They were on edge though. Why those children? And where was the being that had left them there? Gotta love translation problems. In one chapter, Ed says niter and in another he says salt. I went for salt here. 
Not much happening in this chapter but it has to start somehow. Winking face the next update will be on the 3rd of October. Beginning summary. Full Metal Alchemist, Naruto crossover. Ed and Al tried to resurrect their mother but something went wrong. Not only did they fail, their bodies paying the price, but they are no longer in. Amestris. They are in a world where all the natural rules aren't always obeyed. Thanks to all the people who reviewed, added this FIC to their faves and story alerts already. Smiley face, and thanks to the people who I talked to about using the Japanese suffixes, I've decided that it'll make things far too difficult for me and yeah, I'll just be using the names for techniques and such but that'll be the only time I should be using Japanese in this fanfic. Full Metal Ninja by Dark Ice Dragon Beginnings Naruto stared at the spot where his former teacher had just been standing in a few seconds before. He then glanced at the unfinished bowl that Aruka had left behind. He never did that. Not unless something really important had come up and he absolutely had to. Aruka had sensed something, that was obvious. Naruto wouldn't have noticed the whatever it was if he hadn't been with Aruka at the time. Naruto grumbled to himself internally. His former teacher was still able to sense stuff that he couldn't. How was he supposed to become the Hokage if he couldn't even do what Aruka could do? Even though, there was something that was making him feel slightly uneasy, it wasn't the thing that that Uruka had sensed because. Naruto was feeling it after Uruka had, or maybe he was just having some sort of delayed reaction. He was feeling uneasy, he didn't know why and it was bugging the hell out of him. Naruto decided to train instead of going in to see Sasuke at the hospital like he had been intending to do. He was fine since the old hag had seen him, or whatever passed for, fine, in Sasuke's world. And Sakura was with him anyway. Not that Sasuke would notice. He grinned to himself. He'd get even better and once Sasuke was out of the hospital, wouldn't he be in for a surprise? Ed twitched but didn't open his eyes. He subtly took in a deep breath and wondered. The room didn't smell familiar. There was no smell of dusty books at least. That was almost a given at his house. He stretched his back a little and was surprised to feel that there was the softness of a bed beneath him and not the floor. He had a soft murmur of surprise. A creak of a chair. Ed scrunched up his eyes before opening them, eyes towards the sound. His vision was still a bit blurred but it wasn't too bad. A few blinks later, his eyesight was nearly back to being completely normal. There was a young woman sitting on the chair next to his bed. She had blonde hair that reached her collarbone. Looking up higher, Ed saw that she had brown eyes and, a small blue diamond in the center of her forehead? A tattoo perhaps? She looked at him curiously. He stared back at her, not intimidated. This seemed to amuse her for some reason to which, Ed glowered at her even more. But this obviously wasn't his bed, not that he and his brother usually used one. He turned his head away from the woman, searching around. This wasn't even his bedroom, it was too white, too impersonal, too clean. There were a few books and other pieces of paper around about though, mostly on the floor that he could see from his vantage point. His next thought went to his brother. Where? As if sensing Ed's growing agitation, the woman had stood up from her chair and moved the curtain that was drawn behind her. Behind the curtain was Al, prone, unconscious. Or maybe sleeping, Ed reasoned not hurt that badly, he hoped. He swung his legs over the edge of the bed and was about to push himself off when the woman stopped him by placing a firm hand on his shoulder. Ed looked up at her in surprise. Why had she stopped him? He needed to make sure, to see with his own eyes that his brother was okay and not just from a distance. She looked sad for some reason, her eyes downcast slightly, shaking her head at him slowly. It was when she started talking that Ed realized that he couldn't understand a word that she was saying. Not one sounded even remotely familiar. He shook his head, as if that gesture would clear his head and make him understand. He hoped that he hadn't hit his head or something and he could no longer comprehend what other people were saying. When he was looking at the woman again, she had an expectant expression on her face. Could you repeat that? Ed asked her. The woman blinked in surprise and then frowned quickly. She repeated what she had said, slower this time. Ed stared at her lips, but the words still didn't make any sense. 
He shook his head to convey that he still didn't understand what she was saying. He shrugged just in case he might be answering something by shaking his head. She pointed to his legs. Eyes following the finger, Ed saw the blanket still covering his legs. He continued looking and began to realize that something was very, very wrong. The limbs under the blanket were a little, lopsided. His right leg extended to the edge of the bed where he'd been about to get off consequently his foot dangled over into thin air. Staring at the left side however, there was the same lump in the blankets but it stopped short before reaching the edge and the blanket dipped alarmingly, as if there was nothing there. Ed tore the blanket away from his body, not wanting to know what was underneath but the need to know was stronger. He felt the blood drain away from his face and it was as if his heart had stopped beating. His left leg was fine until it reached below his knee. After that, it ended with a stump swathed in bandages, along with his heart, it suddenly felt a lot harder to breathe. Ed tried to feel if he could actually tell that he was missing his lower leg. He knew that he was sending signals from his brain but, obviously, nothing happened. He still thought that he had both legs still thought that he could feel the toes in his left foot. He could still move his toes in his right foot though so, at least, there was no damage there. Phantom limbs. Ed remembered Granny saying once. It was something she came across quite a lot when she was giving her services as an automail mechanic. It was when a person, even though they knew they had the evidence right in front of them, even though they knew that they were missing a limb, they still thought that the missing limb was there and that they could feel it. It could be years before they stopped, feeling, that limb, conversely, they could have been, fine, without the limb and then suddenly the, feeling, came back to it. Added to that, it could even feel painful and since it was all in the mind, painkillers wouldn't be able to help in any way. Whatsoever. What had happened? Ed thought numbly. How had he lost his leg? What? The woman said something again, this time with a questioning lilt at the end. Losing his track of thought, Ed scowled at her but he welcomed the distraction because it meant he wasn't thinking about that and he could start bringing his bodily functions, like breathing and his heart beating, back in order. I don't understand you, he said slowly. Pronouncing each syllable clearly, not that there was much chance of her really understanding his words except through his tone. She sighed but she was hiding a twitch at the corner of her mouth. She pointed to herself. Tsunade she said clearly. Hokage. A small pause to check he understood. Right, her first name and second name. But why the big gap in between the two? He only looked young, and it obviously wasn't because he was short damn it. He wasn't dumb because of that. She then pointed to him. That was easy enough to get the meaning. Edward. Ed Elric. He pointed to his brother. Alphonse. Al Elric. Tsunade nodded to herself, repeating the names. Ed glanced down at his leg again. He looked sharply to his brother and then to Tsunade. Al, did something happen to him too? He asked quickly, the words tumbling out of his mouth. She stared at him patiently before she shook her head, not knowing what he was saying. Arg. How was he supposed to mime, does my brother also have a limb missing? And then it came to him, he could have slapped himself it was so easy ed pointed to al and then to his missing limb he looked up at tsunade in what he hoped looked inquiringly she nodded understanding she then shook her head slowly ed's heart lifted at that al wasn't hurt but why was she leaning forward tsunade tapped just below his left elbow trailing down to his fingers he stared at his hand he turned it over slowly so that the palm was facing up he clenched and unclenched it easily. Al had lost his left hand. How? Ed yelped as he was lifted by his armpits and carried easily to his brother's bed. He was gently sat down at Al's head. Looking up at her in confusion, Ed saw a strange expression on Tsunade's face. She looked at Al and then back to him, and then, he realized. Look after him. Ed nodded resolutely. No wonder he didn't recognize that look the first time. It wasn't often he met other older siblings, but it wasn't as if he really needed to be told in the first place. After making sure that Ed wouldn't fall off of the bed accidentally, Tsunade swept up her scrolls. Why scrolls? Ed wondered. 
people actually used them, and books and left the room with a wave and a smile. Ed waved back at her uncertainly as she disappeared out the room. He glanced at Al, making sure that he was still resting peacefully, he was. He rubbed at an eye tiredly. He may have woken up but that still didn't mean he didn't need to rest some more. Checking on Al one more time, Ed carefully went under the blanket, making sure that he didn't disturb his brother. What had they been doing? Why were they missing limbs? The answer was there. He knew what it was. But his brain wasn't cooperating. Just as the answer was about to come to him, Ed had closed his eyes and fallen fast asleep. A clatter of shoes slapping on tiles. Raised voices. Hearing that, Al woke up with a start. The first thing he noticed was that there was a white tiled ceiling above his head. The second thing he noticed was that there was a warm body next to him. From the corner of his eyes, Al could tell that it was his elder brother sleeping next to him. When he tried to sit up, Al then noticed that something was decidedly missing when he fell on top of said elder brother with a yell. Ack. Well, his brother was up ow. Al, Ed said, his face shifting from surprise to worry when he saw who had woken him up. Are you okay? Al grinned sheepishly. Yeah. I'm fine. Ed's face softened, knowing that he was lying. You're not. Al wriggled off of Ed before he lifted his left arm to look at what was left of it. He was pleased that he could still move his elbow but, he just wasn't processing the fact that he no longer had a left hand. He poked lightly at the stump and winced at the small jolts of pain that sped up his arm. Definitely not a trick or illusion of the mind. Ed's hand clamped down on his wrist, just in case he tried to do it again. Don't, Ed said softly. Al stared at it for another second before looking up at Ed. I've lost part of my left leg, Ed supplied, Al not needing to actually ask. Al nodded slowly, seeing the uneven lumps under the blanket now that he knew. The two brothers glanced to the door as they heard people running past it. It was then that Al started to properly look around the room that he and his brother were in. Brother, where are we? He asked. Ed shrugged. Dunno. A hospital, by the looks of it. There was a nurse or doctor here before, when I woke up. Um, her name was, he paused, a concentrated frown on his face. Tsunade. Hokage. He said the name slowly, wrapping his tongue around the strange syllables. She doesn't speak the same language as us. Ear cocked towards the door, Ed listened to the yelling that was drifting through the closed door. I don't think anyone here does. Al had been listening to the words also and had come to the same conclusion. But why are people running around the hospital and shouting like that if this is a hospital? Al wondered out loud. They'd wake the people who are meant to be resting. Like us? Ed asked Riley. Hmm, Al agreed, a small smile forming. The two were silent, listening to the voices that they didn't understand. There was a pause in the shouting as the sound of running feet began again. It was quiet when the footfalls had faded away. What were we doing? Ed whispered, it wasn't because Ed didn't. Want to disturb the peace that had been created from the absence of the racket but because he didn't need to raise his voice to be heard. Ed had pushed himself up so that he was leaning on the headboard soon after he had woken up. Al had done the same, but he slouching a little bit more than Ed. Al cast his mind to the last thing he remembered. He remembered being in his home but that was normal. Something more specific, rain, lightning. But lightning wasn't blue was it? An alchemy reaction then, but of, what? I remember, Al croaked out. Ed turned his head and looked at his brother in concern after seeing his face. Wah! He was cut short when Al flung himself on his brother, a half-chalked back sob escaping his lips. Mother, we must have failed. As soon as Al had finished the first word, he felt Ed tense. He felt Ed's arms go around his shoulders and his breath through his hair. A tremble traveled up Ed's body and his breathing came in gulps. It wasn't enough, Ed murmured. Our blood wasn't enough to bring her back. Al didn't try too hard to hold back his tears. He clutched at the unfamiliar top Ed was wearing, assumedly from the hospital with his remaining hand and he could already tell that he had left quite a wet patch where his head was. But we calculated everything, he exclaimed, his breath hitching and wavering at every word. 
He heart was feeling heavy from the realization. They had failed to bring back their mother. Ed's arms tightened around him. What is the cost of a human soul? Ed asked hypothetically. We thought that our blood would be enough to bring back mother. In theory, since we're both her sons, there was a part of her in each of us. Al understood what Ed was meaning. But that's just biologically. Mother's memories, her personality. His brother nodded. Yeah, he said faintly. What can we give in exchange for a human soul? To make her exactly what she used to be like before? All we gave was a few droplets of blood. The two lapsed into silence again, finding comfort in each other's arms. Al's sniffles lessened as they stayed like that, the contact reminding him that all was not completely lost. Hey, Al, Ed said after a few minutes, yeah? You remember his journals? There was only one person that Ed used that tone towards, fathers? A grunt. Do you remember what he said in them, about the philosopher's stone? Al paused, memories of cracking the code and what they had been able to glean afterwards coming up in his mind. He nodded. They can bypass the equivalent exchange law. But that's just a myth, Al added with a frown. Ed shrugged. It had to come from somewhere, right? He thought it over. In every legend and myth, there was said to be a grain of truth, if that was the case here. Al looked up at Ed's sigh. This is all my fault. If I hadn't made the suggestion about bringing back Mum in the first place, this wouldn't have happened. Al opened his mouth to protest. It wasn't all Ed's idea. Al had wanted to do it too. Ed continued before Al could say anything. Once we find out where we are and we find a way to get around, Ed gestured towards his leg. We'll start looking for the philosopher's stone to restore our bodies, Ed said determinedly. Al was silent for a few seconds. When we find it, we could use it to bring back mother too. Ed mulled it over. Maybe. For all we know, the philosopher's stone might not be as powerful as we think it is and we might have to choose between our bodies and mother. If we restored our bodies and then used it to bring back mother and it still wasn't enough, Ed trailed off, not needing to continue. Okay, Al said firmly, it was going to be tough from now, Al knew. With parts of their bodies missing, but things could have been worse, Al shivered at the thought. His older brother responded by bringing the blanket up further and wrapped it around them both. Don't worry Al, he assured him. We'll be able to do it. Al gave his big brother a small smile. It was going to be hard but they were going to do it together and that was what mattered, he hugged his brother tighter. And the ripples start, along with dramatic irony, which I love writing, and an abrupt ending. Much head shaking. Bah. Hmm. I feel like I've overdone it with the semicolons. Either that or I'm using them in dashes wrong. And at the start, too many short sentences. I'm also wondering if I should put in the meanings, translations behind some of the words, Hokage, Ure, etc. At the end of each chapter like I did. Do with crossing over is never easy. With this crossover, it isn't as Japanese heavy. At the moment, let's see what happens if a fight comes along, as coin but still. So should I add in the glossary thing for both sides of the canon at the end? Well, uni's finally started for me but that shouldn't affect this FIC until about January. Which is also the time of when I have exams, cringes. But hopefully I'll be a little further ahead in the chapters by then to not be affected by that either. The next update will be on the 7th of November. Babysitting Summary. Full Metal Alchemist, Naruto Crossover. Ed and Al tried to resurrect their mother but something went wrong. Not only did they fail, their bodies paying the price, but they are no longer in. A mistress. They are in a world where all the natural rules aren't always obeyed. Thanks to all the people who reviewed, added this FIC to their faves and story alerts already. Smiley face, it means a lot to me. Full Metal Ninja by Dark Ice Dragon Babysitting, Tish. Whatever ya stinkin' pervert. Naruto grumbled in his head. Like Jiraiya actually knew what it was like to know someone like Sasuke. Naruto walked down the hospital corridor, not taking in much about his surroundings. He knew where the exit was and dodging around people wasn't hard, there weren't that many people in the corridor anyway. He had his thoughts on other things, like Sasuke and 
Sakura. He sighed and scratched the area of hair behind his ear. What had happened during that fight? I'd barely even started before they began using the strongest techniques that they had been taught. And then Sakura was in between them before they were about to hit each other, when they were unable to pull back, unable to change direction, unable to do anything apart from fall, jump towards her. If Kakashi hadn't stepped in and threw them away from each other when he had. Oi, Naruto. Naruto paused at the calling of his name, waiting to see if there was going to be anything else said. Turning his head behind him, he saw Tsunade leaving one of the rooms that he'd just passed. What? He said grumpily, shoulders hunched. He wasn't in the mood to be talking to anyone at the moment. Tsunade jerked her head to the room she had just left. I've got a small mission for you, she said, before turning back into the room, not looking back at him. He perked up a little at hearing this. A mission? What kind of mission? It'd better be a good one. Or at least something interesting. He followed her in, already feeling slightly better than what he had been before. Until he saw the people who were in the room. He stared at the two boys for a second before glaring up at Tsunade. Babysitting, he said flatly. A D rank mission. And the two were at least eight, they were old enough to look after themselves, he thought sourly, he had been looking after himself at that age. Tsunade sighed. Not exactly. They don't know our language and, well, I heard that you got on well with Konohamaru. That he looked up to you. She shrugged. They seem interested in learning our language, she added. Peefed. Naruto crossed his arms. I'm not a teacher. Why ain't Uruka teaching him? As soon as he said that, Naruto remembered the conversation that he had had with Uruka the day before. Every Chunin and Junin available were being sent on missions. Even the teachers at the academy and the people who hadn't been on missions for years, never mind. So you accept the mission then? Tsunade asked him sweetly, smiling as if she already knew his answer. He eyed her and then snorted. Yeah, yeah, whatever, Naruto said while waving his hand at her. He knew that she was basically asking him to and that it wasn't officially a mission. He definitely wouldn't be getting paid for it, that was for sure. But it could get his mind off other things for a little while. Maybe. She nodded to him curtly. Keep them out of trouble, she warned him. She then hesitated for a second. And just be careful if they want to move around the hospital. Shizun's going to be bringing a wheelchair when she's going through the rounds. Naruto was surprised by that word of advice. Why? Not that it was obvious since she wouldn't want them hurt again but still, she didn't have to say that, he wasn't that stupid. Look closely at their eyes, she hinted, glancing back at the two. So Naruto did. He held back a hiss as he saw that the two boys had gold eyes. Just like Orochimaru. They stared back at him, curiosity on their faces on their faces before they began talking to each other quietly. Huh, he said lowly. So soon after his attack on Konoha, people were going to be more jumpy than they usually were. Since this was a hospital for ninja, and it wouldn't matter that they were kids, Naruto had enough proof of that. Tsunade grunted as a reply. She then smiled at the two and waved at them. Bye. The two mimicked the wave and what she said. After she had left, there was a brief uncomfortable silence. And a staring contest. If they were dangerous, the old hag wouldn't allow them in the hospital without some sort of guard at least, Naruto reasoned to himself. Course, if they were, and Tsunade asked him to look after them then she trusted him with something like this, he thought with a small grin. But they weren't doing anything except from staring at him. Really dangerous that was. So what am I supposed to do? Naruto muttered under his breath. He sighed and then pointed to himself. Uzumaki Naruto. May as well start with the easy stuff. The boy furthest from him spoke up first. Ed Elric. He then lightly elbowed the boy next to him. Naruto saw that that boy was missing the lower part of his left arm, which was why Ed hadn't jostled him too hard. Looking back at Ed, he saw that he was missing part of his left leg. Well, they had to be here for a reason didn't they? Al Elric. Naruto's brow furrowed. Why were they putting their family name after their given name? Maybe that was how they did things. Where they were from. 
So were they brothers or cousins. To Naruto, they looked similar, so probably brothers. Not that he really knew, he thought with a mental shrug. There was a thinly veiled expectant look on the boys' faces. What was he supposed to do? Just point and say what it was. That seemed rather stupid and he'd look like an idiot doing that. Uzumaki, Ed said slowly, tripping over the pronunciation. Naruto shook his head. Naruto, he corrected. Ed blinked in incomprehension and then scowled at him. What? He was angry at him because he wanted them to call him by his, oh. How the hell was he supposed to explain that? A few seconds thought and he had a vague idea on what to do. Naruto pointed to Ed. Elric. Then he pointed to Al and said, Elric. And then pointed to himself. Uzumaki. They should be able to understand that, right? Understanding bloomed in their faces. The two boys nodded. Hum, Naruto. Ed said, this time a little bit faster, finding his given name easier to say. Ed pointed to his own forehead, a puzzled frown on his face. E.H. Forehead. Naruto reached up and touched the same area that Ed was pointing to. His fingers brushed against metal. Oh, my. Forehead protector. The two repeated the words slowly, saying each syllable carefully. Ed was still pointing to his own forehead, to the very center of it. It's the symbol of the leaf, Naruto explained realizing what ed was actually pointing to twin blinks naruto sighed irritably was he going to have to talk in one word sentences to them all the time leaf again they repeated the word where were these two from how come they didn't know the language or the sign of a ninja they had to be complete civilians but what people had such different colored eyes that wasn't part of a bloodline limit um al hummed looking around the room he pointed to the curtain and asked something in his language. None of it sounded even vaguely familiar. What's this? Naruto hazarded a guess at what Al was asking. The two repeated the phrase, still looking at the curtain. Naruto groaned. Sakura had more patience than him, didn't she? Why was he the one to do this? Right, he was just walking past the door and Tsunade caught him. No what's this? He pointed to the curtain. Curtain. The two boys' eyes lit up in understanding. What's this? Al asked experimentally, pointing. Table. What's this? Window. What's this? Bowl. What's this? Didn't he already? Oh. Wood. Wood. What's this? Fork. Knife. Spoon. What's this? Steel. What's this? Uh. Hospital food. He rolled his eyes and made a face. The two's grins widened at the comment. What's this? Light bulb. Naruto was already regretting the idea of telling them the phrase. As soon as he'd answered one pointed finger, the other would point at something else. But at least he didn't feel stupid because he wasn't the one who was pointing. They seemed to enjoy it though. Weird. What's, ah, Al? Getting excited from learning new words apparently, Naruto didn't know why but at least they weren't staring at him, had been leaning forward to point, Naruto thought to the door. He leaned too far forward and he wasn't able to keep his balance. Naruto started to move to catch him instantly. Al, clap. Flash. Then all hell broke loose. What's, ah? Al, Ed cried out in alarm. He didn't know what he was doing, he didn't know what he was thinking. He merely reacted to his brother being in danger. Clap. Flash. The bed morphed under his hands to form a much bigger hand underneath Al and caught him. He breathed a sigh of relief when he saw that Al W's and hurt. Al had landed on his back he'd tried twisting around after falling because landing on your back was a hell of a lot better than landing on your front and was staring up at the ceiling. A beat later, his eyes were on Ed and his eyes slid down to Ed's hands. His eyes widened and he pointed at Ed. You can do what teacher can do, he yelled in amazement. What, no I, Ed stopped. He looked down at his hands. No transmutation circle. Just, his hands touching the bed. No way, he whispered, bringing his hands up to his face. It wasn't as if staring at them would reveal how it had happened but maybe, maybe there had been a transmutation circle on his hands that he didn't was there, or something. 
Just then, Naruto started shouting and pointing at Ed, his eyes wide in shock. Ed winced. Geez, he didn't know someone could actually yell that loudly. But even though there was still the language barrier between them, it was pretty obvious what he was saying. What did you do? Ed helped his brother get back on the bed, ignoring Naruto for the moment. How can you do what teacher can do? Al asked him over the racket. Ed scowled at Naruto. Alchemy, he snapped at Naruto. Didn't he know alchemy when he saw it? It normally didn't happen with just a clap of the hands but the reaction after was still the same. Naruto was quiet at the word, mulling it over while also mumbling to himself. Ed shrugged at Al. Dunno. I just, he trailed off. He remembered what teacher had said when the two had asked her about how she was able to do alchemy without an array. True knowledge, Ed breathed. What, Al began to ask but then paled. That door thing, you saw it too. Ed nodded, remembering the strange, intricately designed gate, the invisible being, and those black arms. Yeah, I saw it. That, entity said it would show me, true knowledge. He looked up at Al, realizing something. If you saw it too, that means you can do it. Al frowned and glanced down. But I don't have two hands though, he said quietly. So why don't you try with your foot? Al's head snapped back up, with my foot, he repeated. Incredulously, pointing to his right foot for further emphasis. Yeah, why not? Ed said while shrugging. Teacher said that her hands were the circle and she was the formula remember? So, a foot and a hand would make a circle wouldn't it? It was a guess but it did make sense. That a weird way that only happened when you didn't think about it too much. They'd never seen teacher use a hand and a foot but why would she? Using two hands were a lot easier than bringing your foot up to clap, if you could really call it clapping. His brother sighed a little resignedly. I'll try it then. Al shuffled back a little bit for more space to move his feet and for when he placed his hand and foot onto the bed. Ed looked up at the sound of a click in the near silent room. It was Tsunade. No, Hokage, Ed corrected himself, if their last names came before their first names, walking in, an annoyed frown on her face. Ed held up a finger to his lips when she glanced at him. An eyebrow quirked at that and she turned her gaze to Naruto. He shrugged helplessly and then started talking quickly, but at least quietly, pointing to the both of them, as well as using wild gestures. Ed was only able to catch his and his brother's name from it all and the rest seemed to be just one word with a few breaks in between. Not really interested in trying to understand what Naruto was saying for the moment, Ed checked back on his brother to make sure that he hadn't moved too far back and Ed wasn't going to have to clap his hands again. Whatever Naruto was saying, it made Hokage's other eyebrow go up. She took a step forward and was then able to see that it wasn't just a blanket fallen at a strange angle. She regarded it curiously before looking towards Al. Okay, Al muttered. He looked up at Ed for reassurance to which. Ed grinned at him. Seeing that, Al's shoulders relaxed slightly and he managed a nervous smile back. Clap. Flash. Ed looked down and saw that the hand was away and all that was left was the hospital bed as it originally was. Al's eyes were wide. I did it. He whispered in disbelief. He looked down at his hand and foot. That worked? Ed pretended to be offended and crossed his arms. Of course it worked, he huffed. He dropped the facade a second later and beamed at Al. Al grinned. He opened his mouth to say something but he was interrupted by a polite cough. The two turned their heads to Hokage. What, Ed was only able to understand the first word and the rest was unintelligible. Although, come to think of it, if he remembered what Naruto had been yelling, Naruto's version had a few more words in it Ed noticed with amusement. So he now knew some swear words in this language already. Alchemy, Al answered, knowing what she was asking. Hokage cocked her head at the word. Alchemy? She repeated. She asked something else in her own language but Ed and Al looked at her blankly. Ed snorted to himself. Which part of a mistress are we in if they don't know about alchemy? He muttered. I mean, we're from Rezembul and we know about it. Okay, they probably didn't know alchemy because they had a different name for it, but didn't they know what an alchemic reaction looked like? 
Hokage glanced between the two of them. She tutted when she didn't get an answer from them and then asked another question. A mistress? Ed and Al froze. Their attention was now completely on her, their mouths agape. They didn't know what the name of the country was. Where were they? Yes, the ending was contrived. Shish. P. Sighs. When I change my chapters, my regular breakers don't show up anymore. That's why later chapters use my earlier breakers but this one I changed and now my regular one doesn't show up. Just read it the same as my earlier ones. Depending on what happens. All my other breakers get stripped, I'll either keep the XXX breakers or start using breakers that tell us to use. When that happens, I'll go and edit all my chapters so they're the same. The next update will be on the 5th of December. Evidence Summary Full Metal Alchemist, Naruto Crossover Ed and Al tried to resurrect their mother but something went wrong. Not only did they fail, their bodies paying the price, but they are no longer in. A mistress. They are in a world where all the natural rules aren't always obeyed. Went and realized two things that were wrong with the above summary before I corrected them yesterday. I'd spelled resurrect. Wrong. Only using one R. And I'd also spelled Naruto as Naturo. This is what happens when you spell something wrong, don't realize that you've spelled it wrong, and then start copying and pasting it. Facepalm. Bet there's still another mistake in them anyways. Cough. The rating's gone up because of Ed's mouth. I was actually expecting that it'd have been because of Naruto that the rating went up first but eh. They're both foul-mouthed when you get them riled. P. Much thanks to Crows Scared for beta reading this chapter and slogging through my mistakes and making this chapter better. Smiley face. And thanks to all the people who reviewed and or added this FIC to their favorites and or added this FIC to their story alerts. It's appreciated loads. Full Metal Ninja by Dark Ice Dragon Evidence Tsunade watched, confused, as the two boys paled at her question. What had she said wrong? Ed had said it, so it couldn't have been a Taboo word for them. She tilted her head with curiosity when Ed pointed to the sheaf of papers she held in her arms. Leafing through, she found an empty sheet and passed it over, along with her pen, to Ed's impatient and trembling hand. Ed looked at the pen in surprise, turning it over and bringing it close to his face to examine it better. He tested it on a corner of the paper and then started sketching. It looked vaguely like a circle with an uneven edge dipping with a small oval eating the top of the circle. The edge was too precise to be due to Ed's shaking hand so it had to be. Intentional. Ah, of course, Tsunade realized, the Ida clicking into place. They're from an island. Knowing that made things a lot easier for her. If their community was completely isolated from the rest of the world, they wouldn't know about ninja and how long they had been isolated would also explain the different language and strange clothing that they had been wearing. Though the clothes were different, they weren't all that dissimilar to what the civilians wore in Konoha, which made things a little strange, she watched as Ed. Expanded around the circle, adding more areas. Territories, maybe? So how big was this island altogether? He scribbled some unrecognizable characters in the areas and then, in much bigger. Lettering, something else in main area. A mistress, he said, hand splayed over the biggest area. She nodded, frowning slightly. Was that the name of their island or just the biggest area? Resemble? She recalled the other word that had been emphasized. It had seemed important to them. Ed and Al glanced at each other, but didn't seem as worried as before. Scanning the paper, Ed drew a tiny circle in the southeast corner of the biggest area. Tsunade stared at it, intrigued. Normally when young children drew where they were from, they exaggerated the size, not diminished it or made it the right proportions compared to everything else. It was the whole perception that their home was so important and huge that it was obviously the biggest place in the world. Tsunade turned her palm up towards Ed, a silent request for the paper and pen. He passed them back without hesitation. Tsunade turned the paper over leaned slightly on the bed, and began to draw fire country and its neighbors. She finished after a minute and then drew a circle around wave country and added an arrow pointing to fire country. Fire country, she said, pointing to the ground. Wave country, she said slowly, tapping in the circle with the other end of the pen.
looking pointedly at the two, hoping they would get the idea. She hadn't thought that the two boys could get any paler and their eyes had widened as far as they could go. Ed's breathing had become harsh and Al had started to tremble. Al scooted over to Ed's side, seeking small comfort from the physical contact as they both continued to stare at the paper like it was going to bite them. Tsunade shook her head, slightly disturbed by their reactions. They must have thought their island was the entire world. Her frown deepened when she looked at her drawing. From wave country to fire country, it was quite a distance for ones so young, particularly civilians. They certainly weren't acting like ninja at the moment so the distance should have been too much for them. For these two to get to the mainland they would have needed to take a boat or at least some kind of transport. That alone should have shown them that the world was a lot bigger than they thought. The two boys continued to stare at the hand-drawn map and leaned against one another, still not making any other movements. Unless they'd been kidnapped, if that had happened, then there was a large probability that they'd been bound, blindfolded and gagged whilst traveling. If they somehow managed to escape, they wouldn't even know which direction they had come from. The other possibility was they'd been drugged, which led to more questions. Why were they kidnapped? Why were they left there by the kidnappers missing an arm and a leg? And then back full circle to. What was that energy we felt? They could be the sons of an. Important person in a mistress and so, worth holding for ransom. The. Why were they abandoned by the kidnappers? Could be that the ransom wasn't paid or the payoff went wrong and the two boys were left for dead. Similarly, it could be because of their bloodline limit that they were kidnapped with no intention of ever being given back to their parents but that, again, begged the question of, why were they abandoned? The mysterious energy signature still evaded explanation and that was assuming the answers she'd considered so far were right. That's, not, possible, Ed said haltingly. Just where the fucking hell are we? The words were a harsh whisper. Not only did Hokage not know that a mistress was the name of the largest country but then she started to draw a map that neither he nor Al recognized. Judging from that circle she drew around the area in the southeast, she must have thought that a mistress was a tiny island. Gah! And the squiggles she drew on those, countries made no sense either. Brother, Al murmured. I don't understand. What? How? Why? He shook his head, trying vainly to sort out his confused thoughts. Not that Ed could blame him, his own head was in just as much disarray. All this is pointing to. Ed nodded solemnly. Yeah, I know. It made sense and absolutely no sense, all at the same time. They were scientists damn it, and their only, logical, answer from the evidence they'd seen so far was not logical. When you have eliminated all which is impossible, then whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. What happens when the impossible is? The truth, Ed thought wryly. He closed his eyes and took a deep breath to try and calm his whirling mind and organize his thoughts into some sort of order. Okay, Ed thought, the evidence we have so far. The people here don't speak the same language we do but as far as we know, all. Amestris's neighboring countries and beyond do, except for a couple of regional variants teacher mentioned but this sounds totally different. These people haven't heard of a mistress, I don't think. Not from their reactions anyway and so soon after the Ishvalan war, that can't be right. Their clothing is very different, granted, we've only seen a handful of people so far here and the furthest we've ever to was Dublith but the outfits these people are wearing are so much more outlandish than anything we've seen. This lady and the others we've seen could be some weirdo cult with no dress sense for all we know and the rest of the population dresses like we do. Ed paused his thinking process to rub at the side of his face with one hand. When he kept his eyes closed he found it easier to focus on the evidence. Feeling the comforting warmth of his little brother leaning against him he continued with his train of thought. Alchemy doesn't seem to be recognized here but in a mistress, it's a state qualification and recognized everywhere. It could be a translation problem, but. Hokage's reaction doesn't support that theory. R. And that map she drew, it's like nothing I've ever seen before. It wasn't in any of his journals. In fact, all the evidence suggests we're in another world but that's just not possible, is it? No, this is just a very strange. Joint dream Al and I are having. We'll wake up back home and everything will be fine. 
But if that was the case, why did everything hurt? How did he remember feeling the mind-shattering pain he'd experienced those scant few seconds he was conscious in that forest? He and Al still didn't know how they had actually gotten to the hospital in the first place and maybe they wouldn't for a long time if they didn't learn the local language. If this was indeed a dream, he shouldn't be feeling twinges of pain in his stump of a leg. He shouldn't be feeling the semi-rough fabric of the covers underneath his fingers. He shouldn't be smelling the scents of the hospital, the smell of medicine and bleach. If this was a dream, it was far too realistic, there were too many senses involved. That pretty much ruined Ed's hope that this was a dream, no dream could be this real, so that only left his original and more disturbing theory and one he didn't want to think about just now. It brought up a lot more questions which even collectively, neither he nor his brother could answer. It should have been impossible, it was impossible. How could they be in a different world? Ed was distracted from his distressing thoughts when he heard Hokage speak. Not knowing if the question was directed to him or not, he looked up to see her eyes focused on his left leg. Following her gaze Ed realized that whilst his thoughts were trying to untangle themselves yet again, his hands had crept down to clutch at the bandaged stump. Stepping closer, Hokage repeated what she had said, emphasizing the lilt at the end and glancing pointedly at the stump clutched in his hands. Ed shrugged, not understanding. She poked his stump, not too hard but it still brought a sharp pain to him and he yelped, pulling away from her. Hokage snorted softly, before turning her attention to Al, asking the same question, he nodded briefly. What was she asking? Ed asked, watching Hokage heading towards the door. I think, Al said uncertainly, she was asking if we were in pain, she was watching you when you started to hold your leg. Hum, Ed murmured. There wouldn't be any other way to show you were in pain would there? He mused, moving his hands away from his stump. It didn't really hurt, but it throbbed enough to make him grimace when a wave of pain made itself known. Now that he was more aware of it, the pain seemed to increase. Hokage had barely stepped out of the room before she returned, a tall, black-haired woman following her. Al looked at his brother skeptically, an expression that Ed wasn't used to seeing on his brother's face. How about screaming? Tsunade moved to exit the room again, leaving Shizun look after the two boys and give them the painkillers they obviously needed but were unable to ask for. Naruto was lurking in the doorway uncharacteristically quiet. She lowered her voice to address him. Make yourself useful, brat. The blonde ninja looked up at her ready to start yelling but she quieted him with a look. When Shizun's finished, take them to the canteen on this floor. Naruto's eyebrows raised. His eyes moved to stare at a plate of leftovers on the windowsill. He frowned. There was only one plate but two boys. He looked back up at Tsunade who shrugged nonchalantly. I was hungry while studying them. She breezed past him, smiling and waving at the two brothers through the open door. A few minutes later, Shizun was finished with her brief checkup and as she hurried to her next patient, she told Naruto that there was a wheelchair outside the door for Ed to use. Peering out the door, Naruto found the wheelchair, it was fairly old, its dark red upholstery faded and patched in places and the metal frame looked in need of a good polish. Wheeling it into the room, banging the door frame and leaving a dent, Naruto discovered that. Its wheels were thankfully well oiled with no squeaking and it moved smoothly, despite its forlorn appearance. Moving the wheelchair to rest perpendicular to the bed, Naruto wondered if he was supposed to lift Ed into the chair also. Why the hell had he been stuck with this? he groaned. How far was he supposed to go in helping them? Even though Tsunade had said she'd been told he was good with kids, he didn't know how to deal with these two. The decision was made for him when Ed leaned forward, grabbed the armrest in one hand and swung around, pivoting on one of the footrests to set himself down in the chair. Ed looked up, glaring, as if to say, I do not need your help with that. It reminded Naruto too much of Sasuke's glares. But Sasuke's glare didn't soften like Ed's when he looked at other people. Ed's glare melted away when Al slid off the bed to stand next to him, Naruto. Shook his head sourly, and he was looking after these two to try and distract himself from Sasuke, not to think more about his stupid teammate. 
The two were watching him curiously. Ed's neck twisted at a painful angle from his position in the wheelchair. Food, Naruto said, pointing to his open mouth. To drive the point further, he also pointed to the empty plate on the windowsill. The two brothers smiled at him, understanding the gesture and nodding, before starting a conversation in their own language, chattering away at each other with speed. Getting a firm grip on the handles, Naruto began to move the two out of the room. Before they'd gone more than a few steps, he noticed Owl looking somewhat uncomfortable. He kept on glancing at Ed and then to Naruto. Ed sighed when he saw this, muttering something under his breath and directing his words to Al. Whatever Ed was saying it caused Al to glance down at what was left of his arm and then his gaze went to the handles clasped in Naruto's hands. Walking down the near empty corridor and avoiding the occasional nurse or doctor rushing to deal with some emergency it took a while for Naruto to realize what was bothering Al. He wanted to be the one pushing the wheelchair but with his handicap, he'd have problems steering. Not knowing what to say Naruto grinned at him and Al smiled back, unseen by Ed, who sat facing forwards in the wheelchair, Naruto's grin turned sneaky and then he pretended to swerve the wheelchair out of control. Ed squawked, flailing wildly, fearing that he was about to crash into something or topple over. When the wheelchair finally stopped he twisted around sharply, ready to berate the clumsy blonde pushing him, but then Al's muffled giggle behind his hand reached him. Then he had a slightly different reason for shouting. Damn, Naruto thought, a bit odd, he's louder than me, that actually hurt. The quotes from Arthur Conan Doyle's character Sherlock Holmes. Hey. They quoted the fly once, winking face. I realized while writing the later part of this chapter, that Ed and Al are around about the same ages of the main cast. I kept on thinking that they were a lot younger since Ed's about 15 during most of the manga, anime later on. But anyway, the comment that Tsunade made about, from wave country to fire country, it was quite a distance for one so young, is because she thinks Ed and Al are around about 8 to 10 years old since no one's asked them their age it is wasn't an important question to ask. I'm using Ishval and Ishvalan instead of Ishval because that was how it had been spelled in the earlier manga chapters, and I like the sound of them better. The next update will not be on the 2nd of January. Sorry. Exams are making me nuts at the moment and I've sworn myself off of the Net until the 21st of January when the last of my exams are done and dusted as of the 26th of December. The only thing I'm going online for is to check my emails and for uni. So while I'll be able to read any new reviews, I won't be answering them until I come back, officially. Watching Summary Full Metal Alchemist, Naruto Crossover Ed and Al tried to resurrect their mother but something went wrong. Not only did they fail, their bodies paying the price but they are no longer in a mistress. They are in a world where all the natural rules aren't always obeyed. Finally back with a new chapter. Sorry I wasn't able to update last month but I was going to have my exams the next week and my beta reader hadn't gotten back to me yet because she was busy around that period as well. The new semester started for me and I still haven't written any new chapters for this yet mainly because I've hit a roadblock and might be scrapping my original plan of what was going to happen later on. But that should be okay because that was boring anyway. P. After talking about it with my beta reader, I've decided to switch the names around for the Naruto cast. I've edited the last two chapters to show this with a bit of added dialogue but it's only a couple of lines that doesn't affect the overall storyline apart from Ed and Al calling Tsunade Hokage now. Free I'm not sure I've caught all of the changes though. Thanks to all the people who reviewed, added this to their favorites and alerts the last chapter and for waiting patiently for me to update. And also thanks to my beta reader, Crow's Scared. Smiley Face. Full Metal Ninja by Dark Ice Dragon watching ears still ringing from Ed's outburst, the three boys made it to the canteen a few minutes later. Naruto felt the hairs on the back of his neck prickle as he sensed the glares coming from all around as soon as he stepped into the room, but he ignored them as he always did. Hey, they could be glaring because of the racket that Ed had just shouted up and it had absolutely nothing to do with him. Or they could be blaming him for making Ed yell in the first place, it ended. With the same thing really. The three of them joined in the queue to the till, Ed and Al peering curiously at the sandwiches laid out in front of them. 
After a few seconds of staring, they selected two different types and put them on the tray, both looking like they were hoping the food tasted like it. Looked. Naruto didn't hold many expectations that they would. The canteen didn't sell ramen. A fact which Naruto had found out a long time ago but it still annoyed him no end and so he also grudgingly, selected a sandwich for himself. The two were getting fidgety, Naruto could see it in the way their heads kept on turning slightly to the side and then looking forward again that they were observing something but not wanting to be seen doing it. Which, after staring at everything and not caring, it was different behavior for them. But they hadn't been around a lot of people yet, as far as he knew so they could just be shy of large groups. Their voices were muted too, like they were trying not to be overheard. Naruto snorted and the two boys looked back at him, curiosity and worry flickered across their faces. The dark-haired woman behind the counter was eyeing Naruto distrustfully and scowled at him as the distance between them got steadily smaller and smaller. As soon as she realized Naruto was watching, she turned back to the person she was serving, a smile plastered on her face. Al murmured something to Ed, who nodded. When it was their turn to be served, the woman took in the Elric's missing limbs and asked them in a sugary tone, Are you patients? Here, completely ignoring Naruto as he stood there. They are, Naruto answered for them, so just charge me the water and the chicken sandwich. Of course they were patients here, what kind of stupid question was that? The bandages and wheelchair. Were enough evidence. I'm sure they can answer for themselves she said archly, puffing up and looking down her nose at him. Naruto heard some muttering coming from behind him but didn't bother listening to what was being said. Naruto shrugged and lightly hit the top of Ed's head with a loose fist. Ed's reaction was to whirl around and start another tirade, this time more muttered than shouted, hand on the spot and half glaring at him. Al said something to Ed and it quietened him down, though he was still glaring. They don't speak our language, he stated, unnecessarily. Naruto stared at her, a small careless grin on his face, challenging her to deny the fact all the same. The woman stared at him longer than necessary, her face pale, before telling him the price of his food. He handed over the correct amount of change and before the woman's hand was even pulling away, Al was tugging at Naruto's jacket and pointing to one of the tables in the far corner. Sitting around it after moving one of the chairs so that Ed could sit with them easier Naruto was then able to see the two boys' faces properly. Ed's was darkened with anger and Al was frowning slightly as well. Ed's gold eyes met Naruto's blue ones and he indicated the woman with a backward nod of the head. Fucking, he stopped and huffed. Al didn't react to the word other than surprised curiosity, how and? When did he learn to swear when they didn't know any other words? With a sigh, Ed barked softly. Al's eyes widened at the implication. Ed, he hissed and slapped his shoulder. Ed scowled at him before saying something back. After shaking his head and replying, Al turned to Naruto. Naruto. With no way to explain anything to them, Naruto shrugged and waved a hand dismissively. There wasn't a specific gesture that meant normal that he knew of and it wasn't as if he was going to explain the Kyubi to them. The two exchanged glances whilst Naruto started eating his sandwich, Ed and Al following shortly after. Naruto had already eaten half when he heard someone call his name. Eyes flicking up to the person, Naruto half choked when he saw it was Ino. What are you doing here? Visiting Sasuke and Sakura, of course, she said with a grin and a wink. Naruto felt a hint of anger and guilt at the reminder of his teammates but before he was able to tell her that Sasuke wasn't. Around at the moment, she'd turned her attention to the other boys at the table, hi. Hi, they repeated. They then looked at Naruto for confirmation, hi. Uh, hi, Naruto said with a little uncertainty as he waved a hand at them for a demonstration. Al's eyebrows were scrunched up in concentration, bye. Naruto shook his head. Hmm. The two started rapidly talking it over for a few seconds before nodding and then waving at Ino. Hi. Ino was pulling off an expression that was both puzzled and amused. Hi. Her eyes focused on him. Naruto. They don't speak our language. And after saying that phrase twice in five minutes, Naruto was already considering putting a sign around their necks proclaiming the fact, it was getting annoying. 
Sighing, Naruto waved a hand in Ino's direction. Ino. Then he waved the other in the brother's direction, Ed and Al. Both of whom were staring at Ino, twin confused expressions on their faces. Ed looked at Naruto. Ino, no, he pointed to his eyes. No eyes. What did he mean by that? Seeing his bafflement, Ed tried again. This time, he covered his eyes with his hands. No eyes. Can't see. Blind. Naruto shook his head quickly. To demonstrate that she could see, Naruto threw his half empty bottle, cap on properly, to Ino. She caught it with one hand, and with a glint in her eye, she threw it back at Naruto's head. But he still caught it anyway. What made them think she was blind? When was this world going to make sense? Ed grumbled to himself. Ino shouldn't be able to see, she didn't have pupils. If she didn't have pupils, light couldn't get into her eyes. That meant images of the outside world weren't getting in either so there wasn't anything resting on the retina so nothing was being sent to the brain via the optic nerve, she should be blind. But she wasn't. Naruto proved that she could see properly when he threw the bottle at her and she caught it, eyes tracking its movement and reflexes too fast to be catching it from sound alone. She'd even sent it back to him, aiming for his head deliberately, or it had seemed like that anyway. Taking in the tables, chairs and people around them, she would have needed a walking stick to maneuver through it all with no incidents and she had done so without one and she'd found Naruto when he hadn't been saying anything at the time so she had to have seen him then. Had she been born like that? Had her body mutated in such a way to compensate for her lack of pupils? Were her irises somehow also her pupils at the same time? Which didn't make any sense when he thought about it properly. Ed's head was whirling from all the questions being generated and no answers were forthcoming. Again. Or was this completely normal for this world? He and Al had talked about the possibility of things being vastly different on this world. Not that they had wholly accepted it, just hypothesizing, from no alchemy existing to the magic in fairy tales that their mother used to tell them when they were younger being as easy as saying just specific words. To find out, they would have to at least get out of the hospital to see what the other people were like in their daily lives. So far, what they had seen was what they had expected and nothing too out of the ordinary for them. Apart from the stares and the angry muttering that surrounded them when they entered the dining area. To start with, they had thought that it was directed towards them, before seeing that they were glaring over their heads. Naruto didn't notice, or pretended not to. They couldn't ask why, and then they noticed a third expression on some people's faces. Fear. There were a few more empty tables than when they had entered five minutes before. Ed and Al watched the groups as they chivied stragglers and warily glanced over their shoulders every few seons as they did. It was as if they were expecting Naruto to attack them for no reason. Which was another thing that didn't make sense. He was loud but he wasn't dangerous. What did they think he'd do? Shout them to death. When they'd sat down at the table after Naruto's brief staring match with the woman at the till they discovered that Naruto did know what was happening around him but what did that wave mean? Ignore it, don't talk about it. Arg. There really had to be some way to learn the local language quickly. There had to be at least one person who spoke the same language as them. Had to be. Ed scowled, thinking over what he had just gone over in his head, annoyed at his thoughts. Which one did he believe? That he and Al were in a completely different world or that they were on some undiscovered continent of their own world? So why had his earlier thoughts been using this world rather than? this place, without him noticing and seeing nothing wrong with it, just accepting it? Tsunade frowned, staring at the thickness of the wave country folder and suppressed a sigh. It wasn't that thick, not when you compared. Its size to other countries like Fire Country, it made it look downright tiny but she really didn't want to go through more paperwork. All she was doing was going through the recent, and not so recent if her original search proved futile missions to wave to see if any of the ninja who'd gone there were still in Konoha at the moment. Not likely with the current state of things but at least she'd know who to talk to once they had returned. It would also decide what odds there were that the ninja who had been there knew of the Elrics. Her eyes skimmed over the report in her hand. A C-rank mission being upgraded to a higher B-, lower A-rank mission. 
The team had refused to cancel the mission and it had ended in quite a battle on the Great Naruto Bridge. What? That was too much of a coincidence. Naruto wasn't a common name and the chances that the name was connected to the Naruto that she knew. She glanced back to the top of the report, it was dated. Just over two months ago. A genin team with Hitaki Kakashi as the Junin leader. Well, that was interesting. Eyeing the folder again, Tsunade decided to leave the rest of the reports for the time being. She had an elusive Junin to talk to. Al watched as Ed half hopped from the wheelchair onto the bed and twisted around on his palms with ease. Naruto looked at the wheelchair in puzzlement for a few seconds before he shrugged and kicked it back lightly so it rolled back and hit the other bed. Then he plopped down in it haphazardly, grumbling to himself. Hmm. Al's eyes wandered across the room slowly, they hadn't learned that much of this language not to mention the horrors of grammar but every word they knew would hopefully get them closer to understanding and to be understood. Even if it was just everyday items. So he looked around and tried to remember the pronunciations. When his eyes passed the door, Al was startled to see a face peering in. He was a boy, either a few years younger than himself or the same age, with a pair of thick goggles covering all of his forehead. The boy stared at Naruto's back, missing that Al was watching him, and tiptoed in, bringing his knees up high with every step. Ed had seen him too, though it wasn't hard since they were both facing the door whilst Naruto was facing the wall behind them, he was now looking at them curiously. He turned around to see what they were staring at, what's that was when the boy sprung quickly scrambling over the bed and launching himself at naruto's head with a loud war cry al and ed could only watch in disbelief as the two fought each other in front of them with full-throated yells they could both see however that naruto wasn't taking it very seriously or really attempting to hit the other boy just holding him off do you think they're brothers al mused out loud ed snorted yeah None of the words being shouted were anything Al had heard before, but he was betting that Ed was somehow picking up all the wrong words from his previous example at the cafeteria. Though Naruto's name was cropping up every couple of sentences. Huh. Al turned to look at his brother. Their fighting styles, it's a bit like what teacher taught us, Ed said, a concentrated frown on his face. With that piece of information, Al turned his attention back to the other two boys. Even though their fighting was rowdy, they were able to keep themselves to the other half of the room, somehow not disturbing anything, apart from their eardrums, while they were literally bouncing off of the walls. Their fighting style was similar but there were some differences, like their center of balance was much lower than what was normal for he and his brother, and the younger boy did a lot more grappling, though that was probably due to the difference in sizes. Just as Al came to that conclusion, the younger boy misjudged the strength of a jump and barreled backwards into him. Flails. You barely get any dates about how long things take. In between stuff and how long it takes to get to place. Just, it'll take a while, or something. But there was the month wait between the second and third part of the Chunin exams so I based the two months between the end of the wave arc and now off of that. The kid at the end who attacked Naruto is Konohamaru the grandson of the third Hokage, Tsunade's the fifth, and he sees Naruto as his rival. I'm in university, doing a psychology course. One of my modules this semester is Psychology of Language and Thinking, and I had the first lecture on Monday. I had so much fun when I learned just how much problems there are going to be for Ed and Al to really learn the language. Things like grammar, which I knew when I was writing this chapter, syntax, I kinda knew but wasn't too bothered by for some reason. Pronunciations. The double meanings for words in some. Languages but not others. When language is spoken, they usually aren't grammatically correct. Knowing what a person means because of the context. And slang to name a few. D. Joy. This'll be fun to do. Boot. The good thing is, Ed and Al aren't learning language completely from scratch so a few of these will be confusing but they should be able to get through it eventually. Plus, later on, we'll be taught the difference between an expert and novice writer. Laughing face can't wait to find out just how bad I am. But that's gonna be in 7 weeks so I'm gonna have to wait. 
standard disclaimer. Ignore me when I complain about stuff like this, i.e. writing, because it's a habit that I do and I do it about anything I do. Believe me, I'll say anything I do is bad because I'm fairly critical of my stuff. And I'm the sort of person who pokes fun at themselves on a regular basis but I don't really mean anything by it. Basically, don't take me seriously when I complain. 3. The next update will be on the 5th of March. Smiley face until then. Edit. The 3rd of March 08. The next update might not actually be on the 5th of March. I'm still waiting for crows scared to get back to me. Also, just as a heads up, I've got most of the 7th chapter done but there's some stuff which I want to add to it. I normally send the next chapter for beta-ing once I've posted a chapter and it usually takes her about a month to get back to me so yeah, the 7th chapter might take longer than a month to get out. Also around about that time, I'll be handing in coursework so that'll slow things down in the writing stage too. Dream Summary Full Metal Alchemist, Naruto Crossover Ed and Al tried to resurrect their mother but something went wrong. Not only did they fail, their bodies paying the price, but they are no longer in a mistress. They are in a world where all the natural rules aren't always obeyed. Thanks to all the people who've reviewed, added this FIC to their favorites and alerts, and also thanks to my beta reader, Crows Scared, for going over this and adding the last paragraph in the Tsunade and Kakashi scene. Smiley face. Full Metal Ninja by Dark Ice Dragon Dreams Tsunade looked up from the documents she was signing as a knock sounded on her office door. Calling permission for whoever it was to enter she continued to watch as the door opened almost. Immediately, revealing Kakashi who sauntered over to the desk, hands in pockets before straightening up and tilting his head slightly in respect. Lady Hokage, you sent for me? Kakashi asked, his visible eye only half open and bored looking. Anyone who didn't know the Junin would be yelling at him to wake up and show more respect but Tsunade knew it was only a facade. He still looked tired, but had convinced her that he was fit and well enough to be back on duty the day after she had healed him. The Hokage frowned, trying to remember just how long ago it had been since she'd summoned him. The specifics were uncertain due to a sudden influx of missions, or was that because she'd ignored them whilst she was in the hospital? She couldn't think. Kakashi, yes. She placed the pen back in its holder, secretly pleased at the distraction and picked up the report she'd put to one side earlier, glancing over its contents again. You and your team were in Wave Country just over two months ago, she stated not. Looking up from the report, she saw him nod thoughtfully. Yes, it was an interesting mission. Is Tazuna requesting our assistance again? Interesting, he says. Tsunade almost laughed out loud ruefully at that comment. At the end of the battle, after, she checked the name again Haku made the ultimate sacrifice, Kakashi and his team had somehow convinced Zabuza, a dangerous missing nin of the hidden mist village and hired to kill Tazuna, to not fight them but to fight Gatu, his employer, instead. Even with all the injuries Zabuza sustained from his battle. With Kakashi, he was still able to get past all the bodyguards and hired muscle to kill Gatu. No long-lasting injuries were reported in Kakashi's team, a fact which Tsunade didn't quite believe. Definitely a different kind of mission from the norm. Tsunade glanced up from the report. Other than Zabuza and Haku, did you meet or see any other ninja? Kakashi tilted his head up in thought. Two brothers, called themselves the Demon Brothers. Hmm. She had known that from the report and if it had been any other Junin she may have suspected that further information had been omitted from the report or they hadn't been paying close enough attention to their surroundings. However, this was Hitaki Kakashi, former Anbu and student of the fourth. With the type of mission it was, to not notice other ninja and make note of it would very likely end with death. Wave country didn't have a hidden village so the presence of ninja there would have been suspicious. Without anything else happening at the time, and there would have been no cause to omit any information in the report anyway. Placing the report back on the desk, Tsunade carefully considered her words. I'm sure you felt that chakra signature to the south yesterday. Nothing has been found to explain it. Where it came from or where it went. Tsunade intertwined her fingers and rested her chin on them. However, 
the five Anbu I sent to the scene found two civilian boys there. From what I've been able to ascertain, they're from Wave Country. So you think they were victims of a kidnapping, Kakashi concluded. Tsunade snorted and shook her head. I don't know, they don't know either. They act like civilians but they have a physical characteristic that's usual more for ninja, as well as both of them being able to perform a jutsu that I've never seen before, with no hand seals. No hand seals, Kakashi started, eye widening. So it's a bloodline limit. He was watching her carefully now with his visible eye, casual attitude gone. His body language mostly unreadable even to Tsunade, who wasn't surprised. Bloodline limits were the only things that the Sharingan couldn't copy and with no hand seals, it reduced the time of activation making it even more dangerous, that alone. Would make a ninja wary of someone with a bloodline limit but with the troubles Kakashi and his team had had with Haku, it would make anyone more cautious. The strange thing is, I don't think they know how dangerous a bloodline limit can be, Tsunade mused. The way they were acting when I saw them use it, it must have been the first time it had surfaced and they didn't fear it or try to hide it. She paused. It means that they know about their bloodline limit, were told about it and what it can do but they have no ninja training which doesn't make any sense. Had the community they live in been accepting of the difference between them and their family? Maybe they didn't know that being able to do that was associated with ninja or even that people like ninja existed. Or one or both their parents were. Missing Nin but never told the boys they were, but instead told them what abilities they could possibly inherit in the future. You want me to see if I recognize them, Kakashi stated reaching one hand behind him. Tsunade nodded. From what little she knew about those two, it was very likely that they were from one of the surrounding islands rather than the main. Even though there was little chance of Kakashi recognizing the two, she still had to be sure. And no reading that perverted trash that Jiraiya writes around them either, she yelled standing up suddenly and slamming both hands on her desk hard enough to crack the wood. Kakashi quickly backed away several steps before disappearing in a cloud of smoke. Shizune stuck her head in through the door clutching Tun Tun to her chest and sighed as she took in the sight of Konoha's Hokage spitting like a cat and standing over yet another broken desk. Al dreamed. Class. I want you to work out these sums I've written up on the board, Miss Bartle said, book open in front of her and pointing to the blackboard, chalk still in hand. His eyes flicked up to the blackboard for a few seconds and then bowed his head again. Ed didn't even bother doing that and kept working on their calculations, or he hadn't heard what she'd said, too engrossed in what he was doing. Quickly jotting down the answers on another page, Al looked over his equations in workings. Compared to what they were being taught in class right then, something they'd learned to do by themselves a long time ago, this was a lot more complicated. But they'd be able to do it, he just knew it. Ed. Al, pay attention. Ed looked over his shoulder, grinning back at him as they ran down the road full pelt. They stopped beside a rock at the side of the road which was nearly as tall as they were, their usual marker for the finish line. For them it was usually an even chance who could win but today, he won by a large margin because of what Ed was carrying in his arms. Flopping down on the cool grass, they waited for their breathing to even out and for their hearts to slow down. Taking in big gulping breaths and grinning at the same time wasn't exactly easy but they still did it, they couldn't help it. The minutes stretched out, even after everything had gone back to normal. The soft, cool breeze caressed his warm skin and the quiet sound of the tall grass moving was soothing. The sun vanished behind a cloud at that moment but there wasn't enough cloud cover for that to last long. Not that he minded either way. Ed turned around so that he was now lying on his stomach and facing towards him. What do you think mum'll think when we show her what we can do now? He asked, the grin still on his face and his cheeks still flushed pink. She'll be surprised, he guessed. They had stayed up late that night, reading and translating some more of father's journals, while they weren't able to understand what was being said at the time, after a few hours sleep and some more hours spent thinking about it, during school hours, but mum didn't have to know that, they were able to figure it out. They had the theory down and now all they had to do was practice. Yup. With a huff of air, Ed scrambled to his feet and picked up the basket of apples he'd been carrying. 
race you home. Before he'd finished the challenge, Ed was already sprinting away, laughing. Hey! Al scrambled to his feet and pelted after his brother, no fair. Even with Ed's head start, he was still able to catch up by the time they reached their front door. I won, mum, were, mum, mum, Al, he tore his eyes away from his predicament and stretched out a hand for Ed. Both knew doing that wouldn't help them in the slightest but they still tried, exertion and fear coursing through them. He was suddenly stumbling forward and nearly fell to his knees. What? Where was he? It was an open place, all white with nothing in it, or almost nothing, he amended when he turned around to see a dark, something that looked like it was made of stone and several times his size. There was a tree engraved on its surface and it simply floated there, as far as he could see, there wasn't anything holding it up. Hey! Definitely almost nothing as he turned to see the person who spoke. It took a few seconds as he was turning around, to realize that he hadn't actually heard the word spoken but rather, it had echoed in his mind. What? Um. Hello. A humanoid figure sat on the ground a few feet away, but that was all he could tell. Other than the aura around it, it was completely blank. Featureless like a mannequin. Ah, a polite one, the being said happily. Polite in one way but not in another, it said cryptically. What did that mean? As far as he was aware of, he was always polite. Who had he offended? And what did he do to offend them? Who are you? He asked. He didn't want to talk to whatever it was without knowing its name or just calling it you. That is an interesting question, it said, nodding. I'm what you humans refer to as the world. Also known as the universe, or God, or true knowledge, or all, or one. But then, that would mean, and, a hand was raised and pointed at him, I'm you. That doesn't make any sense. There was a large, slow ominous creak behind him. Since the only other thing in this space was that stone tablet, it could only be that making the noise. Why did it sound like it was a creaky old door opening? Welcome, fool. He froze at the voice, echoing much more than the first, being much deeper and making his very bones vibrate. He unfroze when something so cold wound around his legs like a second skin. Black. It was pure black and looked like it had a hand on one end. Then another twisted quickly around his other leg and even though it was impossible, nothing was there to help it do that. It moved like a snake and of its own volition. His thoughts were disrupted when those black things just yanked his feet from under him. For a split second. He thought his back was going to impact with the ground painfully but he didn't. More of those things had wound unnoticed around his upper body and, restrained, him. He'd been trying to get out of their grasp from the start but it wasn't any use, they were far too quick despite his desperate struggles. They weren't just supporting him he realized, they were pulling him backwards, pulling him towards the door. The being said one more thing before the doors closed, I'll show you true knowledge. Al wanted to yell out, scream as what felt like thousands and thousands of bits and pieces of information were unceremoniously shoved into his brain. He instinctively grabbed at one of the arms, teacher's lessons ingrained, and pulled, not knowing why he was doing it. It loosened its grip on him as did the others, he found himself with his back pressed up to that door. But he wasn't in that white place anymore. This place was all black but for a tiny sliver of light coming through the small opening. He was not going to stare at that gigantic eye hovering right in front of him. His right hand spasmed and he looked down, a thin red light which disappeared off into the dark void was connected to it. Pulling at his hand he felt the light somehow pull taut. There was a feeling of familiarity to it, Ed. Somehow knowing that wherever he went, Ed would follow him through the connection, he squeezed his way through the crack. Al twitched as he woke up disorientated by the white walls for a few seconds before remembering he was in a hospital. He knew he'd been dreaming but he couldn't remember what about. He had a vague recollection of his mother but that was about it. All thoughts of elusive dreams left him as he realized there was someone standing by the window. Not too pleased with this chapter. Especially the last dream. Pokes ending. But you finally find out there was a proper reason for what's happened, geez. It was this that sparked off this entire crossover too. D.
Boo. It somehow made sense when I was beginning to type this out all those months ago, snurk, but actually getting it down was just, and I think I may have changed the revolving door bit and just made it new door. That was basically the idea. The gate of truth wasn't just a doorway. Anime spoiler edit. But it acted more like a revolving door so you could get out at a different place. Yeah, would you believe me if I said that I actually started writing this FIC last April and have only gotten to the seventh chapter? Told ya I'm a slow writer. I wanted to put the dreams in italics but since over half of it is dreams, that'd be a bit of an eyesore. The dreams aren't in chronological order and since they're from Al's point of view, it's a bit weird to refer to yourself as your name so it's just, he, instead. For some reason, I can't see my regular scene breaker. I can see the dream ones but, grumble grumble, I bet it's only my computer. Where this shows. But if it isn't, I guess I'll be using XXX now for scene breaks. Which is reminding me of the movie. Blah. The next update should be on the 2nd of April. Should be, because I've got an essay and a report to hand in the following week of the next update and I haven't completed the 7th chapter yet so it might be late again. Seeing is believing summary. Full Metal Alchemist, Naruto crossover. Ed and Al tried to resurrect their mother but something went wrong. Not only did they fail, their bodies paying the price, but they are no longer in. A mistress. They are in a world where all the natural rules aren't always obeyed. Gapes. Wow. I received the largest number of reviews for one chapter that I've ever had for the last chapter. For a multi-chaptered FIC anyway. But the one shot that has the highest number of reviews has been up for over two years so yeah, to me, that's kinda amazing. Irk. Sorry if I still haven't answered your review. Or that it took me ages to reply back. I'll try and get back to you today. Fanfic. Dot. Nets stripped my colon dash etc scene breakers so I'm using XXX for the moment. I'm thinking about waiting for the new upgrades that the admins are saying are coming up and seeing if I should go back and then change my breakers to the actual line ones. Thanks to all the people who've reviewed, added this FIC to their favorites and or story alerts, or added me to their favorite authors list or author alerts, or just read my FIC. And, obviously, thanks to my beta reader, Crows Scared. Smiley face, I also want to thank Lukathia Raikatu for answering my questions on Japanese phases, even though it kinda didn't come up here explicitly. So, enough blabbing, since my notes seem to be getting longer and longer per chapter, and on to the chapter. Full Metal Ninja by Dark Ice Dragon seeing is believing. Al stared at the window, feeling the exact second when his body reacted in fear. A shiver shot down his spine. His body felt as though someone had flipped a switch, turning everything cold, blood roared in his ears and every one of his senses focused in front of him. One of the beings from the door was sitting on the windowsill. It wasn't like the one he'd first encountered since this one was the exact opposite, pitch black instead of white. Or had that one been transparent? But it was similar enough. It was also smaller, Al realized after a closer inspection, and it hadn't moved since he'd woken up. Slowly and carefully, Al eased himself up into a sitting position against the headboard. This being was just as featureless. And genderless as its counterpart, with nothing to indicate any sort of individuality. Clues in its body language suggested that it was probably gazing out of the window and not staring straight at him even though it felt that way. That was the weird thing. It was sitting in direct sunlight but still looked like it was bathed in shadow with no features highlighted. Al suppressed another shiver. Just as Al started to think he was still dreaming the being giggled, bringing a hand to where its mouth would be and turned towards him. Al blanched at the sound. It was childlike in pitch and quality but there was an echo behind it that changed the feeling to something more sinister. Where are you? It asked in the echoing silence, moving its hand back down to the window. Al had been watching for it but there. Wasn't any movement where its lips would be. Its jaw hadn't even moved, he would have wondered if it was actually talking out loud or speaking directly into his mind if he wasn't in danger of disappearing. On the other side of the planet, Al answered, not sure why he was. Still feeling his heart beating a staccato, he forced himself not to wipe his hand on the sheets despite his palm feeling clammy with sweat, 
but he was pleased that his voice only quavered slightly. Are you sure? What? Of course he was sure. There were no other logical reasons for what he and Ed had seen and learned. Al nodded. Yes. The being laughed, its voice deeper than before, adding more layers to the echo. This is a dream isn't it? Al's thoughts started to quicken and panic started to set in. There was no reason for the beings from that place to be here. Or was this place the dream? Which one was real? Maybe they had never left that white space in the first place. Or maybe that place had never existed. Was he starting to hallucinate? Suddenly, Al's circling thoughts were disrupted by the sound of the door opening. Distracted, Al glanced across the room. What would the being do if it was seen by other people? Would it send them to another world as well? He had to warn whoever was coming in. Al took a deep breath and nearly choked on it the next second when he realized that the being was no longer there. Where? Where did it go? He scoured the room for it but there was no trace. Was it just a hallucination? Al bit his lip, worried. But he was sure he'd seen and heard it. It couldn't have disappeared like that, but it seemed like it had just appeared out of nowhere. Yo! Shoving these thoughts to the back of his mind, Al looked at the newcomer and stared. A man stood before him with gray hair that stuck up in a way that defied gravity, but it wasn't this which surprised Al the most. Only a small portion of his face was visible, the rest was covered by a black cloth mask and that headband, belt that he had seen on other people. Al glanced back to the window in case the being had reappeared but it was empty. Still warily regarding the window, Al waved to the man. Hello. The strange man sauntered over to the spare bed opposite Al and Ed's and leaned against it watching them lazily through one visible eye. His gaze continued to flit between the two boys for a few seconds before settling on Al. He asked a question and he was surprised when the mask hadn't muffled the man's words as much as Al thought it would. Remembering some of the questions that some of the friendlier nurses and doctors had asked him and his brother, Al responded. Al Elric, he stated, pointing to his chest before pointing to his slumbering brother. Ed Elric. Moving his arm reminded him sharply where Naruto's little brother had landed on him earlier as he felt a slight pull in the muscles. Another light poke revealed that the spot was tender even though there were no signs of bruising but it wasn't something that couldn't be ignored. He had a few scratches on him from when Ed had yanked Naruto's brother off of him a bit too fast along with a spectacular bruise on his shin from a flailing foot. He was lucky that they people liked wearing sandals if a little heavier than the ones he knew and not the boots Winry was starting to wear. Hearing his name, Ed's brow creased as he woke up slowly, mumbling something Al didn't hear. The man watched Ed as he did. Ed blearily caught a short glimpse of the man when he then pushed himself off the bed and then left without another word leaving Al to simply stare as Ed finally came to full awareness. What had he come in for? He couldn't have been someone who was sent to look after them since he'd only stayed about three minutes at most and the way he'd looked at Ed, maybe he was confirming something. But what? That they both had gold eyes? Having gold eyes was a bit uncommon, but Al didn't think it was rare enough to warrant just wandering in to where the person was sleeping just to settle a curiosity. Al's eyes flicked to the window again. Still nothing. Was it just a. Al? He turned to look at his brother. Ed was peering at him in concern as he got up to lean on the headboard next to him, grunting a little. Hum. What's wrong? He asked. You're really pale. Ed's face darkened. Did that guy try something? If he did, I'm gonna. Al cut him off with a shake of his head. He'd just come in when you woke up, he explained. There was a brief silence as Ed waited for Al to tell him what was actually bothering him. I think I saw, Al trailed off, not sure what to say. He took a deep breath and shook his head once more before starting again. I think I saw one of the beings from that door just before the man came into the room. There was a violent, whoosh, of air next to him as Ed exhaled quickly. Looking at his brother, Al noted that Ed had gone wide-eyed and as pale as he probably was right now. Did it say anything, do anything to you? Ed demanded as he checked Al over to make sure that he was in the same condition as he had been when Ed saw him last. I'm fine, he reassured Ed. It didn't do anything, we talked. That was it. Which obviously wasn't the right thing to say. 
That was it, Ed repeated incredulously, his voice rising. That was it? Right after I talked to something from there the last time, we ended up on another planet. Ed froze from his rant before his face screwed up in anger. Arg. Fuck. On the other side of the world. Not another planet. He corrected himself harshly, clutching his head. It wasn't exactly the same as that one. This one was completely black, Al told Ed softly, ignoring his slip. He had been doing the same in his own thoughts. Its voice was different, younger, creepier. There were too many ways he could describe the being's voice and most contradicted each other so Al didn't even try. Ed mulled this information over. So what did you talk about? Al looked to the window, just to make sure it hadn't reappeared there. It asked if I knew where I was. When I said the other side of the planet, it laughed. Saying that brought back the sound it had made and Al grimaced as the sound grated on his nerves and resonated in his head. An elbow poked his side lightly and Al snapped his head back to his brother who was watching him in concern again. If it was going to come back, it would have already. Ed sighed and slouched further on the bed. It was probably lying anyway. Who knows? Maybe that's just another way they get their kicks. Ed snorted and crossed his arms. Thinking over his words, Al could see Ed's point, it didn't completely erase the worry but it did ease it somewhat. Quite a few of his reactions would have been from the adrenaline running in his system and the fear of what could happen next. Al wiped his still clammy palms on the covers to dry them. His heart had at least slowed down to its regular beat and he no longer felt the chill down his spine. Who was the old guy who came in? Ed asked. Al looked at his brother in confusion. Who? They had both fallen asleep around the same time and he had woken up before Ed. How would he know he had come into the room? He might have woken up earlier but went back to sleep, he reasoned. Ed waved Hishan to indicate the door. The old guy who just left when I woke up. Oh, him. But he didn't really look that old, Al realized, only that he had gray hair. In the little of his face that could be seen, there weren't any visible wrinkles and he was a healthy color. I don't think he's that old, he said out loud. He just had premature gray hair. Hmm. I guess. Ed wrinkled his nose. I wonder what happened to him to make him cover his face like that. It's probably a big scar, Al said, mulling it over. He didn't have any difficulty speaking and his voice was normal. Ed looked thoughtful, nodding his head slowly. That would mean that the scar would probably cover his eye down to his opposite cheek. Ouch. I wonder why he's wearing that headband too, Al mused. Why didn't he use another piece of cloth? The headband might have been easier to put on but it wouldn't cover as much. Maybe he just didn't want to wear two pieces of cloth on his head. Ed nodded. Naruto and Ino were wearing one too. I thought it was some sort of fashion thing but if an adult's wearing one, that can't be right. Hmm. He scratched his head as he thought. The headbands were the same had the same insignia, possibly. Worn in specific places. Do you think it's a symbol for something? Al asked. Like how state alchemists have a silver watch with the military symbol engraved on it. It says that they're state alchemists to other people. That would make sense, Ed said with a frown. But what could kids do that's the same to adults? I mean Naruto and Ino don't look any older than us and if it really was a sign of being something like a state alchemist, what kind of organization would recruits kids our age? That's insane. Well, maybe the younger ones are supervised until they're old enough or experienced enough, Al reasoned. Maybe, Ed acquiesced and sighed loudly. We won't really know until we see more people and figure out what the trend is. Trying to work this out from three people would never work. Al's eyes drifted. You know, he said slowly, we haven't had a chance to properly look out the window. Ed's eyebrows rose. Too much stuff kept on happening. We've spent a lot of time asleep and when we were awake, there was always someone coming in and out to check up on us or we were talking about where we actually were. Together, they crawled to the other side of the bed. Al felt strange having to crawl on three limbs instead of four and was glad they were on the bed closest to the window because, while they would have still been able to see outside from the other bed, it would have been harder to spot anyone wearing the headband from that distance. That is, 
if it could be called a headband since Eno apparently didn't wear hers on her head. They're huge, was Al's first thought. Maybe it was their perspective but the buildings looked like they could be four or five times the height of their own house in Rezembu. The way the buildings were built together lent themselves far more to Dublith in crowdedness than Rezembu but the actual structures of them were, again, similar in some aspects and different in others. Everywhere they looked on the buildings, there wasn't a single scrap of space that wasn't in use and they seemed so crowded with a dizzying variety of items. Each looked as though someone had decided to have multiple houses built one on top of the other with their roofs stuck out around the middle of the buildings usually at regular intervals. That said, Al could see that most of the buildings weren't uniform in the slightest. Ranging from one story to several and sprawling wherever they fancied. Neat it wasn't. The roof parts and actual main roof were made of planks of wood with pipes going across or up them. Thick black wires stood out against the buildings running from pole to pole and several disappeared into houses through small gaps in the wall. Al could see clusters of leaves in the distance and poking above the buildings, so there were obviously, green, areas in this city. Overhanging signs displayed over what looked to be shops had the same kind of symbols Hokage had used when drawing her map. The streets weren't that packed but there were still a few people milling about, after 20 minutes of people watching they gave up. They hadn't seen anyone who was wearing that same headband in the crowd but they'd try again a bit later, they couldn't base their conclusions on the one sample after all. Okay, hands up, who guessed the unwanted visity? Snurk, if you know my writing, you know how much I like using dramatic irony. So many semicolons. No one ever looks up do they? And there's not that many ninja there at the moment so there's nothing to see. P. For once, I don't think I actually have that much more to say about this chapter. I know, shock horror. Though sorry for the lack of interaction with Kakashi. Can you believe that I completed the first chapter of this pretty much a year ago exactly? I'd started to post this after completing four chapters. The next update will be on the 7th of May. Again, I haven't completely finished the 8th chapter but I don't think it'll be that much of a problem. My exams coming up right after that will be. I have got most of the ninth chapter done as well so hopefully you won't have to wait for two months again since that chapter comes. The week after my exams, but since when is that a surprise with my update schedule? Rolls eyes. Breath of Fresh Air Summary. Full Metal Alchemist, Naruto Crossover, Ed and Al tried to resurrect their mother but something went wrong. Not only did they fail, their bodies paying the price but they are no longer in a mistress. They are in a world where all the natural rules aren't always obeyed. Don't think I have much to say here, don't worry, I'm going to be making up for this hugely in the post-chapter author's note, though, could someone have told me that I had a double line in the last chapter? I didn't know that was there until yesterday morning. Anyways, thanks to all the people who read, reviewed, fabbed, put this on story alert, and or added this to their C2. And, obviously, thanks to my beta reader Crows Scared. Full Metal Ninja by Dark Ice Dragon Breath of Fresh Air. Ed looked up when he heard the now familiar sound of the door sliding open. He glanced at the clock. Their plates had been collected a little while ago and a nurse, not Hokage, probably wasn't due to check on them for at least another half hour. A few seconds later. Naruto poked his head around the door warily. Ed wasn't surprised at this since the doctor yesterday had thrown both Naruto and his brother out soon after Naruto's brother had landed on Al bringing the siblings fight to an abrupt end, Al wasn't hurt, save for a few tender areas and bruises, nothing worse. Ed and Al didn't see them again for the rest of the day, even after the doctor had left. Ed had wondered about their absence but other more pressing issues soon pushed the thought to the back of his mind and since neither of the two boys appeared again, he didn't think about it. Seeing no one else in the room, Naruto came in with a grin. He started talking quickly, so quickly in fact that he didn't seem to be taking a breath. Walking towards Ed, he snagged the wheelchair, which stood forgotten in a corner from the previous day, and stopped when he reached the beds. Leaning on the handlebars, Naruto's grin somehow widened even further and he said one word as he pointed to the door. Out. And by the way Naruto was grinning, 
Ed had a feeling that he hadn't been told to or he'd been specifically told to not take them out. Ed grinned back at him. Beside him, he heard a half laugh, half sigh. Turning to look at his brother, Ed saw Al softly shaking his head but Ed could also see the small smile on his lips. Straightening up, Al looked between the two in well-practiced exasperation. Naruto was still waiting for an answer, but not patiently because he was no longer leaning on the handlebars and was instead, bouncing on the balls of his feet. He didn't seem to notice Al's look. Without a word, Ed slid off the bed and Ito the wheelchair, Al following on foot after him. While he was glad that they were getting out again, Ed felt that he and Al were being used a little bit as revenge against the doctor. Leaving the room wasn't going to cause any harm apart from worrying the staff, and he and Al were getting bored with nothing to do apart from staring at the walls. They couldn't read any books, couldn't study, couldn't leave the room without supervision, or talk to people. It was beginning to drive them nuts. They walked around for a while, Naruto helping to expand their vocabulary in the usual way and giving a tour of the hospital at the same time. The hospital was huge, with wide corridors and large windows overlooking more of the city. Not that he could see that. Much from his chair. There weren't as many people in the corridors this time around but that was hopefully a good thing, meaning. Patients didn't need the doctors as much, while they were moving. Ed still noticed the looks people around them were throwing their way. Most were of the same mixture they'd received yesterday in the canteen, though not as concentrated. Why did a lot of people here seem to hate or fear Naruto? There didn't seem to be a reason for it, Naruto was likable enough, maybe they didn't like his swearing? But that didn't make sense because someone swearing shouldn't make people fear you. Ed huffed. He and Al were probably never going to work it out since Naruto knew about it and didn't want to talk about it or ignored it. Maybe he couldn't talk about it because he couldn't explain it in gestures and the handful of words that he and Al knew so that it made sense. Maybe. Hmm, he didn't seem bothered about it though. Ed yelped and jumped in surprise when Naruto suddenly shouted, Oi! And then a word that he didn't recognize but seemed to have. Lots of ease in it, it was like he'd yelled right in his ear. Everyone turned to look at them and then almost instantly turned away when they saw who it was, all except one person. He had crutches wedged under his arms and stood waving at them awkwardly. The unknown word must have been his name then. Ed took in the other boy's appearance and nearly choked. He wore a very fitted, like a second skin almost, all in one suit in a somewhat garish bright green. How did he get into that? The material didn't look anything like what Ed had seen back home. As a belt, the boy was using the silver band. Like Eno had been, they couldn't keep calling them headbands if they were being worn as belts as well. The cloth was red, unlike the others blue. Did the color have a significance? The boy was also wearing some sort of really thick bright orange socks. Al elbowed him in the arm to stop him staring openly. The other boy smiled at them. Hello, Naruto. Naruto's grin came back full force. Seeing his curious look to him and his brother, Naruto introduced them with a practiced wave of his hand. Ed. Al. Geki Mayu. Ed and Al waved. Geki Mayu bowed. They started to walk again. Naruto and Geki Mayu chattering away at speed, Naruto sometimes waving his hands exaggeratedly and Geki Mayu nodding. Ed. Wondered as they moved. Geki Mayu was obviously a patient here, he didn't have that much grace with the crutches for him to have been using them all that long but he was wearing different clothes from what he and Al were, so that meant he'd at least been here just a little longer than they had or someone had brought him his clothes. What had happened to their clothes anyway? The deconstruction of their limbs Ed hastily shoved the imagery away shouldn't have affected their clothing. Apart from the amount of blood they would have inevitably lost after the deconstruction had finished. Ed thought with a grimace, they'd most likely had to be cut out of them and were in the trash, cut to ribbons. Which led to the question of how they had been found so quickly. The body could drain itself of blood in minutes under the right conditions, and in his and Al's case, they had both had more than just a small cut. Doing this wasn't helping, he berated himself with a shake of his head. Asking questions was good, but only if there was at least some way to get the answers. At this point, 
All they could do was observe and ask extremely simple questions and get extremely simple answers back. They wouldn't be able to learn what they wanted until they got much better at this language, but they knew that already. Why did he keep on asking the same questions over and over again? What's wrong? Al asked softly, his eyebrows drawn in worry. They seem to be asking each other that a lot recently, Ed thought wryly. Ed sighed and shifted about in his chair. It wasn't made to be slouched and easily he grumbled to himself in annoyance. He gave up and leaned an elbow on the armrest instead. Nothing new. Just the same old questions with some new ones. Ah. Naruto slowed to a stop and after an awkward conversation with Geki Mayu, the other boy shook his head with a smile and hobbled to the large slide doors on their left and opened one. Wow. The buildings looked even larger when there was no glass in the way and closer up. The cool breeze that hit them when the doors were opened was also a relief after being in a stuffy room for so long. Ed leaned forward in the chair to see better as Naruto pushed him forward into the fresh air. It was a pretty large courtyard with an expanse of grass all around and for some reason a line of logs had been set up sticking halfway out of the ground over in one corner. As a backdrop there were buildings like the ones he and Al had seen from their window towering over the far wall. Only these looked taller than in their room. It must have been because they were at a lower perspective now. Also, from this angle, Ed could see a lot clearer that they were right about the buildings not being made completely out of brick but the platforms that stuck out randomly of the buildings were made out of wood. Weird. Why had they been built like that? They looked a lot different from the regular cube-like structures that they were used to. Al made similar noises of wonder beside him. The four of them wandered slowly over to the line of logs, Ed wondered at the logs poking up through the grass. Each one was covered in dents, had bark missing, chips knocked out and or several odd holes. The wall behind was similarly punctured. So, they'd been used as target practice? In a hospital? Weren't the doctors and nurses worried that their patients would hurt themselves in another way? Or were they for the staff? But if they were, patients wouldn't be able to access them as easily as they had. Naruto pushed the wheelchair so that he was next to the log closest to the corner while Geki Mayu stood in front of one, two logs down. Geki Mayu then declared something to Naruto, a determined look in his eye before he started to punch the log over and over again. Was he allowed to do that? Ed wondered. He guessed that he was, since the logs were there in the first place but was he supposed to do that if he still needed crutches? Depending on the injury, if he was still recovering, then doing that would make the injuries worse. Except in others, it would help the person to heal faster. Ed winced as a particularly loud, crack, split the air. If he hit any harder, he was going to break the bones in his hand. No, Al had realized the same thing. No, um, yeah, they really needed to learn a lot more words than the handful they knew. Ed mimed punching the air in front of him. Al nodded in confirmation. Naruto actually snickered while Geki Mayu smiled at them. The two of them pointed to the silver headbands, saying something. So they were right, it did hold some sort of status, but what? If Geki Mayu was training to keep physically fit even while recovering from an injury, then maybe it was some sort of military thing, or, he just wanted to keep fit. Not everything they thought mildly weird was going to have an equally strange explanation, Ed reminded himself. Lee. Geki Mayu's eyes lit up at the sound of the new voice. Was that his nickname? It was kinda interesting that it was more familiar sounding than the rest of what he and Al had heard during their stay here. Or maybe there was someone around here or a whole place that spoke a similar language to them. Geki Mayu said something back. Ed assumed it was the other person's name, before continuing at a fast pace, leaving Ed to wonder where the person's name ended and where the rest of the sentence started. Ed turned to look at the newcomers and again found himself staring. Walking towards them was an exact copy of Geki Mayu. Or was it the other way around? Together with two other people. As they neared, Ed was able to see that Geki Mayu's twin wasn't exactly the same. This new guy was taller and wearing a thick green sleeveless jacket. Blah. Ed hoped he'd never end up looking that much like his father. The two with him were a girl and a boy. Both looked older than Ed and Al. 
The girl had dark hair scraped back into a couple of rather silly looking balls on top of her head and the silver band was on her forehead, but her hair covered what color the cloth was. Her clothes weren't that different, though they were still a little exotic, and it was pink. The other boy, Ed sighed and scrubbed at his face. He looked like he had cataracts, but Eno had been able to see when she didn't have pupils and this guy was similar, if with even lighter eyes. Again, there was no white walking cane in his hand. He had also noticed Ed and Al staring almost straight away. What? He said, glaring. Naruto was glancing between the two groups, a concentrated look on his face and then groaned. He said something that made the other group look at him in surprise before looking at Ed and Al in confusion, or anger in the non-blind boy's case. He demanded something but Naruto intervened with a phrase that Ed was quickly recognizing as, they don't speak our language, he added something that maybe sounded like it had Eno's name in it and then the boy's anger lowered, and he nodded curtly, though his eyes still reflected annoyance. So seeming blind but actually being able to see was normal here, it wasn't sex linked either, though they really should have known that since it was a girl that they had seen it in first. Or maybe it had been around a while if this was the second generation or later. Ed's head snapped to the right, eyes wide with disbelief. A little distance away, leaning on the wall next to the other group was an entirely jet black humanoid. It was like seeing the invert of the being at that door. He heard a muffled gasp next to him, letting him know that Al had seen it too. Why weren't? Why weren't they even moving? Couldn't they see it? If they just turned their head a little bit, it'd be right in front of them? No. Ed realized with shock, they couldn't see it. All of them had seen his and Al's reaction and were looking curiously at the spot where the being was but they didn't so much as blink and then looked away. As soon as Ed came to this realization the being disappeared, he laughed, unable to help himself, they were stuck on another planet. Unable to speak or read the local language, missing a limb each so they couldn't travel anywhere without help and now they were being haunted by one of the things that had brought them here in the first place. Oh, this was just great. In between the hysteria and laughter, Ed registered Al leaning heavily on his wheelchair, taking in quick shallow breaths. As the laughter petered out into giggles, Ed straightened and hugged his brother. Those beings were just doing it for kicks, or maybe just the one was. They'd seen them twice now and nothing good or bad had happened either time. Maybe it was only the white one that could send people to other places. Or something. He filed the idea away for further consideration when he was feeling a little less giddy. Ed tensed when something came too close for comfort. It was Geki Mayu's father, half squatting in front of them, frowning a little. He murmured something soothingly, holding up a hand. When Ed and Al relaxed, he slowly brushed some of Ed's hair away from his face and put his palm there, taking his temperature. A few seconds paused then he did the same with Al. He straightened up and asked Naruto something. A short conversation later and both were looking serious. Moments later Ed and Al were moving back towards the hospital building being pushed by Naruto and the others remained by the logs. Well, at least they'd gotten some fresh air, Ed thought as they passed back through the doors. Absolute love of commas and semicolons in this chapter. Irk. I'm starting to think that I'm going just a tiny bit overboard with how much Ed brings up the noticing how everyone looks at Naturo. Thing. But if he can't work anything out, then he'd probably keep on going at it, says my beta reader. This should be the last time it's brought up for a while. Thanks to Lukathia Raikatu for correcting me on Lee's nickname, I thought that it was Geji Mayu. Hopefully this'll be the extent of the Japanese appearing in this FIC, apart from Jutsu, when they appear. I'd originally had Naruto correcting himself but then thought that he wouldn't so there might a few Lees floating about when they should. B. Geki Mayu, uh, it just seems to slow the whole sentence for me though. Roll's eyes. So many questions in this chapter. Do they have lifts in the hospital? Sex linked, is the actual term for a gene only expressing itself in males. It doesn't mean that a woman doesn't have that gene. But if she does have that gene, then she'll be a carrier, and won't have the disease or whatever that a man would have if they, the man, had the gene. If the woman then has a child with someone who has the gene, there's a chance that their kid, 
male or female, could then have the disorder, disease. If the woman has the gene in both of her chromosomes, then she'll have the disease. Thanks to sadfulness, for pointing this out for me. I'd go into a lengthy tangent about it but you've seen how long this author's note is haven't you? Any questions about this, just ask. E.H. My exams are going to be at the end of the month. Fun. On the other hand, I'm pretty confident for getting an all right mark in language and thinking. We had the writing topic, and seeing how experts differ from novices. This wasn't in terms in spelling etc but more in their cognitive functions while writing. From that, I'd say I'm halfway between a novice and an expert. Though I'm leaning more towards novice. The next update will be on the 4th of June. Edit. Or maybe not. My beta reader still hasn't gotten back to me yet. Should I wait for her to get back to me? Or should I post up the next chapter and then update with the beta version once she's sent it to me? Practicing summary. Full Metal Alchemist, Naruto crossover. Ed and Al tried to resurrect their mother but something went wrong. Not only did they fail, their bodies paying the price, but they are no longer in a mistress. They are in a world where all the natural rules aren't always obeyed. Thanks to all the people who read, reviewed, fabbed, put this on story alert, and or added this to their C2. And thanks to Crows Scared for beta reading this. Smiley face. Full Metal Ninja by Dark Ice Dragon practicing Uruka took a deep breath, savoring for a moment the familiar sense of home. He then wrinkled his nose at just how much he stank of blood and sweat. It had been a relatively short mission, only lasting a few days, but there had been a lot of skirmishes along the way. He declined staying the night, opting to leave straight away and return as soon as possible and with only himself to worry about, it was a rapid journey home. Konoha seemed to sparkle in the darkness. The lights from homes and shops bathed the streets in a warm yellow glow. There were still quite a few people moving about, doing some last minute shopping or out socializing, but it was still generally quiet. Now all he had to do was report in. Then he could return home, shower and collapse on his nice warm bed. At least then he'd be coherent when the Hokage debriefed him in the morning. And that's all that happened, Lady Hikage, Uruka said, finishing his report. He waited to see if she would make any comments or ask any questions. She shouldn't since it was a straightforward mission with no complications. She'd been playing with a pen as she listened to him, rolling it between her fingertips. There was a second silence after he'd finished before she put the pen down with a small sigh, and closed her eyes. All right. The Hokage didn't say anything for another minute, just sitting there. Uruka was beginning to wonder if he had been dismissed when she spoke again. You'll receive your payment at the end of the week she said distractedly. There was another small pause before she opened her eyes. Are you rested enough to begin another mission? She asked, studying him. She leaned back a little in her chair. It's a C-rank mission, she added. Uruka considered the question. He'd had a good night's rest sleeping in his own bed and he hadn't suffered from any serious injuries in the fights. A lot of scrapes, cuts and bruises but they had already been treated, bandaged up or salves put on them. It would largely depend on what the mission was but if it was a C-rank mission, he should easily be able to handle it, he nodded. The Hokage mirrored him slowly. Naruto called it babysitting, she said amused, her eyes focused in the distance. Hearing this, Uruka's eyebrows rose. Naruto had taken this mission? So why had he stopped? He then wryly remembered the Fire Lord's wife's cat and how many genin had been sent after it alone. Also. It was probably a good thing that Naruto wasn't babysitting, or whatever it really was, considering his influence of Konohamaru, but the way she'd said it and knowing Naruto it wasn't exactly that. In truth, your mission is partially that, she admitted, but there's something else I want you to do. The two boys don't know our language but they've been picking up phrases at a fast rate, she said, diving right in. I've heard about your teaching skills. I want you to teach them our language while seeing if you can get them to teach you part of their own. There were no records of this language? Uruka wondered. No one knew it? He shook his head, forcing his mind back on track. It didn't matter that there was no information about the language. They would be learning about it now, which was what mattered. Accepting the mission would mean that he would be staying in the village for an indeterminate amount of time. 
even if the language was closely related to their own it could still take months to carry out there was a level of befriending as well so that they would teach him their language which was probably why the hokage was asking a school teacher for both reasons but why him he thought that the others in the school were better teachers as well as that depending on how things went he could still do other missions as well he made his decision i accept 